morning. And before we continue, it's really important for us to recognize the history of the lands we call home. We're thrilled to have people joining us from all over the world, and we extend our acknowledgments to the Indigenous and traditional past across all territories. For our team, we are speaking to the land on which the University of Toronto St. George campus operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, Mississaugas of the Credit River. And today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people across from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on these lands. So my name is Susan. I'm one of the co-founders of the U of T, U of Bernard, University of Toronto Trash Team, and one of your facilitators for today. I'm also joined by other wonderful members of our team who I'll introduce. Um, and before my time with this group, I worked for the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Um, Many of you may be familiar with that group. Um, I worked with them for more than a decade, helping lead volunteers to lead shoreline cleanups from all across the country, which also contributes to the international coastal cleanup. There we go. <laughs> and so I mentioned I'm joined by other members of our team who are facilitating additional sessions today and tomorrow. We're joined by Chelsea Rockman, Raffaele Gutierrez, and Cassandra Sherlock. Chelsea is assistant professor at the University of Toronto, scientific advisor to Ocean Conservancy, and has been resourcing the sources, sinks, and um, ecological implications of plastic debris for more than a decade. Rafaela has spent a decade studying local development programs for low-income communities in Brazil to improve the socio-productive integration of waste pickers into recycling, into formal recycling streams. And Cassandra has completed her BSc in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology this past June and spent the time since then studying floatable debris in the Toronto Harbour, playing a very key role in the development of data protocols for trash capture devices um, in the Toronto Harbour and across the Great Lakes, and they are lovely to work with. And the workshop is also made possible with support of our collaborators, supporters, so just want to take a moment to thank Ports Toronto, uh, Ocean Conservancy and Environment and Climate Change Canada for their support of this workshop. So uh, we will get into the workshop very soon. Just a very, very quick background on the University of Toronto Trash Team. We founded just uh, about four years ago, 2017, and we are a science-based group made up of volunteers, students, and early career researchers working toward a shared goal to increase waste literacy in our community and reduce plastic pollution in our ecosystems. And we work in three main ways towards positive change. We have community outreach, education and solutions-based research, and um, our website's just listed below uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about us. And these involve community cleanups, classroom visits with waste literacy, lesson plans, and of course, well, what we're talking about today, our collaborative um, work on the CBIN project with Ports Toronto in our local harbor. And this is just a few of our programming. Okay, so that brings us all back to today's workshop, which is why all of you are here to join with us today. So here's a quick reminder and look at our main objectives for both today and tomorrow. This includes the sharing the value of trash trapping devices and their role in fighting plastic pollution, motivating collaboration between all of us, and sharing lessons learned from our experiences to ultimately build a network of teams working independently towards a common goal of this global shared database, which we will get into more details to explain what, that, what we mean by that. Um, so let's just have a look at the main overview of today and tomorrow, and then I'm gonna get into today's agenda kind of time by time, so you have an idea of the, um, for us, the afternoon, but for some of you, maybe this morning's um, workshop. So we're going to cover today the collective vision for trash trapping technology. Here's some stories from projects currently in motion. And then tomorrow, we're going to get more hands-on and learn some more steps that our team has experienced to build and run a successful trash capture program. Um, and then we'll have some hands-on discussions before we wrap with more details on how to actually stay connected um, as we continue to build this network. So um, let's just have a closer look at today. So right now we are in the, the beginning. Um, when we're wrapped up here, we'll have a very short um, icebreaker uh, before we lead to the next session. We'll move on to more details about our collective vision. And um, this will then lead to a look at the successful story of Mr. Trash Wheel. And then that'll be followed by a short break to get up and stretch your legs. And we'll then come back after the break to hear from other forms of trash trapping technologies. And then, oh, sorry, let me just see. Yeah, five minute stretch. Okay, 
just making sure I'm looking at the right one. Perfect. So when we come back, we're going to have a look. We've learned about Mr. Trash Wheel. We'll look at other trash trapping technologies, followed by another sh a shorter break um, before we wrap up with some local stories from our own backyard about work that's being held here. Okay. So as you might have noticed, some of those sessions do come with a Q&A. And um, we'll remind you of how to do this when it's time. But just to let you know in advance how that'll work, we're going to go back and forth between questions people want to ask out loud by raising their hand and questions typed in the chat. So when it's time for questions and you want to ask it out loud, um, on your participants screen in the um, reactions, there is a raise hand feature in the reactions button, or you can um, just type it in the chat. If you raise your hand, then we will call your name before we take you off mute. Um, and of course, a reminder that um, if you have questions, you can also leave them on social to encourage conversation and we will keep an eye out there. Okay, so we're almost ready to get started. Um, let me just, I'm gonna put a link into our, into the chat first before I explain what we're gonna do. Let me just, sorry, I had the link ready and then I used to send something to someone else. So <laughs> let me just pull that up again. Um, we're gonna answer these two questions for those of you who are familiar with Mentimeter. You can, um, there's a code you can enter uh, that's on the screen. Just open up another window on your smartphone or in your browser. Or if you want to go directly to the link that I have now just put in the chat box. That link is there. Um, I'm going to actually change screens to show you the answers as they come in. So what will happen is you'll go to this link or you'll enter the code at menti.com 57118422 um, and then we'll start. You'll see each of these questions in time. So I'm going to share the screen, a new screen so we can see how these answers come in. Okay. So here we are. So, okay, great. People have started to figure out this working. So I'll, I'll let this sit for maybe 10, 15 seconds and see what are the types of things people are hoping to learn um, during today's workshop. And um, now that my instructions are off the screen, you can still see the code here if you want to open up that tab. Okay, so things we're looking to learn a lot about characterization of particles. Okay, so we'll certainly we'll get into our data, um, probably more of that tomorrow, but definitely you'll learn about that work, how they work, more about how Sieben specifically work, trash collectors, lessons, connect with other people, that's absolutely going to happen. Um, best ways to implement education. Yeah, we will certainly cover that. Um, we have a whole breakout room about it. Um, other initiatives, let me scroll up, this is great. Okay, and I'm just going to go to the next question now. Um, we're just kind of curious what everyone's backgrounds are. So. I'll read out the columns because we have a lot of them, so they may not be so super easy to see. Uh, in blue, there's um, those with university academia. Um, so we have six people from there currently, and that number will continue to grow. Uh, we've got in pink here, marinas, industry in red, government in yellow, nonprofits in green. So quite a few nonprofit representation, uh, community groups in that uh, purple color, and then uh, individuals in brown and other also in blue. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm gonna see if I can go back just to this slide for a second, um, just to see if there are any other answers that we missed before going through. Great. Great, yeah, and you can continue to answer this, these throughout the day that's still, still open. Um, and we will have a record of this saved if anyone is curious. Okay, so. I'm going to move on actually now. So it's my pleasure to bring on our next facilitator, Chelsea. And Chelsea's going to go a little bit more into depth about our collective vision. Thank you, Chelsea. No problem. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to share my screen. You can tell me if it if it works and you can see it. Yeah, looks great. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Well, first of all, welcome everybody. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are around the world. We are overwhelmed, blown away, and humbled by the amount of people um, who express interest in registering for our workshop. So welcome. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, we wanted to kick off this meeting uh, with a series of talks from our closest partners, and that's Ports Toronto and Ocean Conservancy, who we've been working with on these issues for years. 
And together we'll introduce to you basically why we're doing what we're doing, a bit about how we're doing it, but really simply to set the stage for this two-day workshop and the work that comes beyond it. So your speakers in the session are, first of all, uh, myself, which Susan already introduced me. And then you have Chris Sawicki from Ports Toronto, who's the Vice President of Infrastructure, Planning and Environment. And then Allison Schutz from Ocean Conservancy, who is the Director of the International Coastal Cleanup. So I wanna start by talking a little bit about the problem. So as many of you in this room know, plastic pollution is a global issue. Plastic litters the entire globe from top to bottom and from the surface of the ocean to the deep sea. By weight, most of the plastic is large, like the pieces that you see here. But by count, most of it is tiny pieces of microplastics. And because our plastic waste has become so ubiquitous, microplastics have become pervasive, cycling in our water cycle, cycling in our global dust cycle, and arguably they've become part of the carbon cycle. And we know that large plastic litter can choke, entangle, and smother wildlife. What we're also starting to understand from work that we do and others do around the world is that microplastics are starting to lead to measurable risk in our oceans and freshwater. And that if we continue to allow concentrations to increase, that risk will become more widespread. So if you look at these two graphs on my screen, the one on the left shows the concentrations of plastic found, microplastic found in freshwater ecosystems around the world with the frequency of those concentrations on the left-hand side. That orange bar is the concentration that from across the literature suggests it caused harm to 5% of species. And because you can see some of that line on the right-hand side of that orange bar, that means that there are freshwater ecosystems that are already experiencing measurable risk to 5% of their species. And on the right-hand side, it's a similar analysis, but depicted in a different way for oceans. The more red you see, the more measurable risk there is. And the purpose there is to show it is increasing with each decade if we continue business as usual. The point of this is it's time to act now. The good news is that across the world, action has started. The global movement really picked up in 2015 when the world agreed that 8 million metric tons of plastic going into the oceans each year was unacceptable. This estimate came from a really famous study from Jenna, Jenna Jambeck, um, a professor at, at a UGA in Georgia, and actually was the statistic of the year. To this day, I still hear this number cited in the opening meeting, in the opening of almost every policy meeting I attend, but I will tell you that this number is now outdated. So a newer model that we worked on with Jenna Jambeck that we recently published in Science shows that using a very similar method, we predict that 24 to 34 million tons of plastic waste was emitted into aquatic ecosystems in 2020. This is three to four times 8 million metric tons. And this is because, first of all, we included fresh water in our system, so we're not quite comparing apples to apples but it's also due to an increase in production, consumption, and emissions of plastic waste. This model was used to project into the future to determine how much plastic emissions are predicted to change under different scenarios for mitigation. We found that if you follow this yellow line, we are headed towards as many as 90 million tons of plastic emissions per year by 2030. And that's if we continue business as usual. Luckily, the world has not agreed upon this future. But our model did predict that in order to follow this purple trajectory to get below 8 million metric tons, that we have a lot of work to do. And the work that we do sort of falls into three general categories for mitigation. This includes waste reduction, which includes bans on single-use plastics, reuse or recycling, um, so they stay in the value chain. So basically anything that reduces plastic waste. Um, it also is, includes waste management. And in this case, really just the collection of waste to be brought to a management facility, however it's done. And finally, it includes cleanup. The strategy we'll focus on today. And I know that we all agree that cleanup should not be the only part of the solution. And some would probably argue that those upstream solutions are probably better. But the reality is that our model suggests that it is an incredibly important part of the equation today and that we need all three types of strategies working in parallel in order to achieve these global targets quickly, or at least 
at least faster than we are now. And this is because only acting on one type of action would require a really unrealistic change given our rising populations. So if we were simply to reduce plastic waste, we would need to reduce 85% of the plastic waste produced per capita across the world. That may be easier in some countries than others, but a reducing 85% of the amount of plastic you currently put in a litter bin is a lot. If we simply waste manage our way out of this issue, we need more than 99% of the waste globally to be managed. For example, today we manage about 6% on average in low income countries and 63% in high income countries. So that is a huge change. And if we just cleaned up, we would need to clean up 77.4 million tons of litter. For comparison, the International Coastal Cleanup cleans up about 10,000 tons per year. So that would be quite a big change as well. So as you can see, there's no one size fits all strategy and we need them all leaving cleanup as part of that equation. And if we do a little bit of everything and tug on them all at the same time, the change seems a bit more manageable. Sure, it's still a lot of work and you might notice we still have quite a bit to clean. And this is where we come in. Our goal today and going into the future is to increase the international coastal cleanups annual collection by orders of magnitude from tens of thousands of tons to millions of tons. We also aim to collect more of the small pieces of plastic than are often collected by hand. Realistically, to reach this goal, beach and shoreline cleanups are going to need to be supplemented with something else. We think that something else includes trash traps. If we start adding the effectiveness of litter traps to the international coastal cleanup, we can quantitatively increase the amount of plastic pollution, both big and small, removed from our environment substantially. We were originally inspired by Mr. Trash Wheel about four years ago when we began our collaboration with Ports Toronto to put litter traps in the Toronto Harbor. John Kellett, the inventor of Mr. Trash Wheel is here today and he'll share a bit about his inspiration for building these contraptions in Baltimore and their impressive effectiveness of cleaning the Baltimore Harbor. I don't wanna steal John's thunder, so I won't say anything about that but I do wanna share the three things we think litter traps do and our vision for these local projects that can collectively form a global network. So let's talk about the value of trash traps. First and foremost, they clean up litter, diverting it from our aquatic ecosystems, but we think they don't stop there. They also collect data, allowing us to quantitatively measure our impact and also inform source reduction by understanding what we are collecting. For example, in Toronto, we collect a lot of pre-production plastic pellets. We know these come from industry as a source, and this has led to a collaboration with one of our speakers here today, um, and also with the plastic industry to work towards zero pellet emissions through regulations, trash traps, and voluntary action. And finally, they raise awareness, inspiring imagination in the community, gaining attention from the media, and they can be a centerpiece for education and outreach. And the really cool thing about this is it all happens locally. And our vision for litter trapping is to inspire independent teams of stakeholders in different parts of the world to initiate their own litter trapping projects, becoming community leaders that act very locally while simultaneously being part of a global solution. And we are seeing this begin already with some of the projects we are part of starting with Ports Toronto in 2017, and then our work in collaboration with MCD and Vasi in Vietnam beginning in 2018. And now this summer in 2020 with the Council for the Great Lakes Region and Pollution Probe who launched the Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup. Beyond our local project here at home with Ports Toronto, our role is to motivate the change, provide the recipe for success, and develop tools for harmonized data collection to enable each local team to quantify their individual impact and share it with the International Coastal Cleanup Global Database. This will allow us to quantify our collective global impact. This summer, we designed a harmonized protocol and an app for daily data collection that you'll learn more about tomorrow. We have also designed a waste characterization protocol for more intensive sampling five to 10 times per season 
to quantify what you are collecting, so the types. We are working with the Ocean Conservancy to modify the Clean Swell app to collect data using this protocol. But until then, we use our own app, the Data Trapper, uh, for the more simple protocol and paper data sheets for waste characterization. Combined, these protocols and applications will facilitate the collection harmoniously of data captured from all across the globe and included in the International Coastal Cleanup. If we can truly together combine our efforts to strengthen the volume of plastic waste cleaned up around the world, we can make a measurable difference and we can do it better together. Our overarching goals for this workshop and the time we have with you over the next two days is threefold. First, we wanna inspire local collaboration. Second, we wanna share with you the recipe to make your collaboration successful. And three, we want to provide you with the tools to collectively work together to quantify our individual and collective efforts and contribute to the reduction of global plastic pollution. We want to thank you so much for being here. And now let's get started. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I want to introduce Chris Sawicki from Ports to share a bit about their story. Chris, go ahead. Thanks, Chelsea. I'll share my screen now. So hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining the Trash Trapping Workshop organized by the UFT Trash Team and in collaboration with Ocean Conservancy. Ports Toronto is really excited to be part of this important workshop today. And as Chelsea uh, indicated, I'm Chris Sawicki and I'm a Vice President here at Ports Toronto. So a little bit about Ports Toronto. Ports Toronto owns and operates Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport, uh, the Outer Harbour Marina and Marine Terminal 52, which provides transportation, distribution, storage and container services to businesses at the Port of Toronto. Ports Toronto is responsible for safety and efficiency of marine navigation in the Toronto Harbour. As well, we exercise regulatory control and public works services for the area within with partner organizations to keep Toronto Harbour clean. For example, as part of our commitment to keeping the Harbour clean, we operate a 24 seven Harbour hotline and respond immediately to reports of pollution, spills and debris in the Harbour. Through this program, we remove approximately 150 million pounds or more than 68,000 metric tons of dredgeate debris and driftwood from the harbor every year. We also lend operational support and volunteers to shoreline cleanup activities within our jurisdiction, including the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority's Clean Water, Our Future Shoreline Cleanup efforts. This year marks Ports Toronto's 110th anniversary and more than a century of stewardship of Toronto's remarkable waterfront. During this time, we've witnessed a great many changes, notably the troubling rise in plastic pollution, which now seriously threatens the sustainability and biodiversity of our lakes and waterways. The Harbour Hotline program and shoreline cleanups, while effective, are operated manually. In response to reports, which can come in the form of calls or social media posts by the public, our Works and Environmental Services Department responds to the area in a small vessel with nets and tools to pick up floating debris. While we continue to offer this important service, which is effective in capturing large debris, microplastics and small debris are nearly impossible to capture using this method. To tackle this growing problem effectively, we partnered with local organizations to explore options for removing plastics in the Toronto Harbor and preventing them from entering our waterways in the first place. Along with our, our longstanding partners, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, Ports Toronto is working hard toward a long-term fighting, uh, fighting floatable strategy, 
It's a mouthful. In tandem with our own sustainability efforts, partnering with the University of Toronto trash team was another important step for us in our ongoing mission to preserve and protect the waters of the Toronto Harbour for future generations. The University of Toronto trash team first approached Ports Toronto in 2018 with a proposal to implement trash trapping technology in Toronto Harbour. This was the beginning of a mutually beneficial partnership that continues today. Internally, for the last several years, Ports Toronto has benefited from the efforts of an employee-led sustainability committee made up of environmental ambassadors from each of our business units. Along with my colleagues, Mike David and Jessica Pellerin, also presenting during this workshop. I'm a member of this committee representing Ports Toronto's executive team. The committee meets regularly to share ideas and identify strategies for employing environmental best practices throughout Ports Toronto's business units and operations. So in 2019, with the issue of plastics and microplastics in our waterways front and center, the committee did some research on sea bins. These are floating trash bins invented by an Australian surfer troubled by the amount of plastic pollution in the oceans. Though I won't spend much time on the virtues of sea bins, instead leaving that to the experts, go to your peers, who will be joining us later in this workshop. After careful consideration, it was determined that the sea bin technology could work well for our purposes, and we decided to move forward with the pilot. So in June, 2019, we installed three sea bins at our Arbor, outer Harbor Marina as part of the first phase of a pilot program. This was the first commercial installation of sea bins in Canada. And we're really proud of that. We saw great success with this launch with the bins providing, proving to be effective in the Marina setting and receiving incredible positive reception from government and waterfront partners, the media, and most importantly, and our most important stakeholder, the public. Given the success of the first phase of the pilot, it made sense to continue the program further and deploy additional sea bins within Toronto's Inner Harbour. So in, in October of that same year, we launched phase two of the project with deployment of two additional sea bins in Toronto's Inner Harbour. Secured to a floating dock positioned in the northeast corner of York Street Slip at Pier 6. In order to quantify the impact of this program and inform our strategy and policy moving forward, Ports Toronto built upon its existing partnership with the University of Toronto Trash Team to focus on research, education, and outreach. As part of this collective initiative, researchers from the Rockman Lab collect and analyze the non-organic debris, including plastics and microplastics, captured by Port Toronto sea bins to determine the origin of these materials. This process better informs the trash team's solutions-based research and community outreach program, which ultimately seeks to increase waste literacy and prevent plastics and microplastics from entering waterways in the first place. The resulting data also helps inform Ports Toronto's harbour cleaning strategies, including the future third phase of the CBIN program, which aims to incorporate a network of trash trapping devices throughout Toronto's inner harbour and support a partnership of waterfront stakeholders. At Ports Toronto, we recognize that waste collection facilitated by trash trapping technology is just one step toward eliminating harmful materials such as single use plastics and microplastics from entering our waterways. The next step is learning from this waste in an effort to educate and change behavior. This is why we so highly value our partnership with groups such as the University of Toronto Trash Team, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, and the broader waterfront community in our ongoing mission to keep Toronto's harbors, harbor clean. We were proud to see that our project sparked interest and movement in our own neighborhood and in the wider Great Lakes region and are excited to see the progress being made in tackling plastic pollution throughout programs such as the Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup, which we will learn about more in greater detail during Mark Fisher's presentation. For our part, our vision is to participate in a global network of trash trapping, 
devices and a connected research hub. While the ultimate goal is to eliminate plastic pollution in our waterways, to get there, we need to motivate others to em employ innovative site-specific trash tap trapping devices and to share their results with the global community in order to engage communities and inspire policy change. We're excited to see the third phase of our CBIN program will take will, where it will take us. To learn more about our program to date or any of uh, Port Toronto's other sustainability initiatives, please visit our website, portstoronto.com. On that note, I'll pass things over to Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Allison, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And I'll admit, I feel like the two presentations before mine really actually cover a lot of what I was going to say. Um, I just also realized my video was not on. Um, so we are just so excited to be here. So my name is Allison Schutz, and I'm the director of the International Coastal Cleanup um, at Ocean Conservancy. One of the key things that we do at Ocean Conservancy is we obviously work on a host of different issues. Sorry, my screen is not, my slides are not progressing. There we go. Um, so we work on a host of different issues that affect our ocean. Um, we are a nonprofit that is based in the United States with offices all across the US with most of us located in Washington, DC. But just because we are based in the United States really doesn't mean that we are solely domestically focused. Obviously, working on the ocean, we really work across the entire globe, and this really goes for almost all of our programs. So some of the programs that we work on at Ocean Conservancy, ocean planning, working on the, the health of our Arctic ecosystems, climate change, but really, obviously, what is bringing us here today is the ocean uh, issue of ocean plastics. And when we think about the health of our ocean, and we think about kind of the equation about our, our ocean, really comes down to two key features and two key elements, how much we're taking out and how much we're putting in. So when it comes to plastics, right, we can understand that obviously I think as we all know why we are here today, we are putting too many plastics into our environment. Too many plastics are reaching our ocean. And so we really look towards how we address this issue. We know that plastics are everywhere, not just in our ocean, not just in the deepest parts of our ocean, but we know they're reaching pretty much every facet of our, of our lives. They're reaching our drinking water, and perhaps even more importantly, they're reaching even our beer and our table salt. So it is critical of why we are working together on this issue. And as Chelsea has already mentioned, right, we know, we, we've seen the slides, we know how we can address this issue before it gets too out of hand and too, um, as it continues to grow at that exponential rate. And as Chelsea already mentioned, right, we know that cleanup should not be the sole solution to this problem. But with the research that she's already spotlighted, we do know that cleanups play a critical role in our future solution set and is one key tool to this solution of this issue. And Ocean Conservancy has been working on the issue of cleanups for 35 years. So we have been lucky and privileged, privileged enough to work with an incredible network of nonprofit partners and really different entities around the globe on the issue of ocean plastics and really notably through cleanups. This effort started 35 years ago as a relatively simple beach cleanup where the volunteers and the organizers got together and said, it's probably a really good idea if we collect data on what we are finding on these beaches and on these waterways. And over 35 years, that effort has really morphed into this global movement. And again, that this is all enabled by this incredible network of local organizations day in and day out working on this issue and every fall mobilizing hundreds of thousands and even at this point, millions of volunteers to come out and engage with this issue and engage with it in a way that people can have a tangible impact. They can see, touch, feel and record data on what people are finding. 
Um, this past year, uh, in terms of the data that has just been released in terms of the 2019 coastal cleanup, we have the top 10 list here. We know that everything since 2017 on the top 10 list is made up of plastics. So we recognize, you know, from, from hard science and research to what experiences people are having on beaches, that plastics is a key issue here. And we must obviously work together to really address this. And we also know the power of these data. But none of this would be possible. None of these data collections, none of this global effort would be possible without this critical network of NGO partners and people coming together all around the world, kind of under this umbrella header of working together to combat this massive global issue. And even in the pandemic times, it's critical, I think, just like events like this, that we come together. It might look and feel a little different, but having that component of networks and networking and being able to talk with colleagues and friends from around the world who are experiencing this issue in a very similar way, but also in a very different and localized manner to us is really what makes our job so incredibly special. And just we feel so lucky to be able to do what we do. This network also understands the impact of quantifying the global impact and quantifying what we are finding and how data can really help drive change. We know data collection can be onerous. We know data collection sometimes when you're working with a general volunteer can be hard to explain about why we're not just asking people to collect as much as they can, but actually to go perhaps a little bit slower and really work on identifying what people are, are collecting. Because we know these data can capture the general public's interest. We know these data can be so useful to explaining the problem on a level that maybe all of us can start to understand. Sometimes when we talk about millions and metrics and tons, it can get tough for the individual, kind of the person that's just out enjoying their local river, their local park, their local waterway. Sometimes it can get tough for them to understand kind of the, the size and the magnitude of this issue. But when we can boil down some of these numbers into, into concepts and, and um, topics that really relate and connect we know we can make an impact and we can know we can boil down this massive issue into something that individuals can really have a tangible impact on. But it's not just about engagement and the general public. We've also seen that these data can drive policy. These data can be used to drive and catalyze policy and catalyze that systemic change in which we know that we need to really combat this issue. So working together with the University of Toronto and so many people on this call, we are so excited because we just love the idea of people coming together from all over the world, working together, learning from other people's experiences. Because as Chelsea laid out, we know that the International Coastal Cleanup has been so lucky to grow and expand and engage over 16 and a half million volunteers around the world and remove over 340 million pounds of trash collectively over the 35 years. But we also recognize that that's just scratching the surface. As we learn more and more about this issue and we know how much plastics are entering our ocean and how much we need to do together to stop and combat this issue, we know we really need to work together and increase our impact by orders of magnitude. So that is why we are very excited to be here and to join this workshop and to listen and learn and really help enable some of this collaborative effort. Because we know that if we continue business as usual, it's not going to be a world, an ocean, a river um, that we want to see in the future. But we do recognize that if we kind of come together and work and document our findings and really work towards increasing our impact by orders of magnitude, we have such an incredible opportunity here to really make a long-term impact on this issue. So you know, Chelsea really laid out the goals and the vision of this workshop. But I think for, from our perspective, we are just so excited because we've seen the power of a network and the, the impact that that network can have and to be able to uh, be part of something new and expansion and expanding and growing um, through this trash trapping network and this trash trap network, to be able to share lessons learned, learn from each other. We are just so excited because we really feel like the sky is the limit in terms of increasing what we are all collecting by orders of magnitude. 
I think that is feasible and that is possible, especially when you look at the power of some of these trash trapping technologies. It is so incredible to think about the idea of something collecting trash 24-7 and then still being able to utilize these data to drive further change and to drive uh, changes in behavior and to drive policy. So we are just excited to be here. There's a lot of folks from Ocean Conservancy on the call, and we can't wait to dive into this, enjoy the breakout rooms, and learn and figure out how we can better be a resource to inspire and enable collaboration with all of the different entities on this workshop and on this call, and really just catalyze this network because really we feel like networks are incredibly powerful, and we just appreciate the time um, and the opportunity to be part of this one. So thank you, and I'll hand it back to, to Chelsea. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much. And also thank you to Chris from Ports Toronto. Allison, if you want to go ahead and take down your screen, um, we're going to go ahead and switch sessions. So we don't have a Q&A for this session, but of course, you're welcome to type questions in the chat and we'll try to answer them, but we will have Q&As for other sessions. So now I'm going to pass it over to Rafaela, who's going to introduce John Kellett, who's really the inspiration, at least behind our work. Rafaela, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, just a quick reminder, we will have time for a Q&A after the presentation, but you are welcome to type your questions in the chat and we will answer them at the end. So you can use the chat now. Um, hello, everyone. I am Rafaela, co-founder of the UFT Trash Team. I'm leading our educational program and also helping the solution-based research program, where, among other things, we create and test methodology to collect data from trash capture, capture devices. So I will share my screen here. OK. So I'm here to introduce our next next speaker, John Kellett. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to share that everything about our trash uh, UFT trash team is started started initially with the idea of bringing a trash wheel to Toronto. We were inspired by the original trash wheel in Baltimore, Mr. Trash Wheel, who was giving a personality with these giant googly eyes. And we love the idea of something that could help clean litter, collect the data, and capture the community's attention, provide a unique platform for community outreach. So in 2017, Chelsea, Susan, and I paid a visit and met John Kellett and uh, Mr. Trash Wheel. We were so inspired that we even create some designs on how we envision that our trash uh, wheel would be here in Toronto. And of course, our design involved raccoons. So we created this uh, <laughs> initially ideas. And then we begin our collaboration with Ports. And uh, so, and here we are right now. So thank you, John, for uh, inspiring us. Uh, and of course, enough about us. It's a really a pleasure to introduce John Kellett who is president and founder of the Clear Water Mills, he invented, uh, inv inventor of the water wheel powered trash interceptor, AKA trash wheel. Uh, his project have been, have been featured in several communication channels as Popular Science, Discovery Channel, CNN, National Geographic, NBC, NPR, and many others. Uh, John Kellett received many awards, including the top honor for excellence in waterfront design from the Waterfront Center, Innovation, Innovator of the Year from the Daily Record, and Best Use of the Technology from Ford Motor uh, Company. So John Ke Kellett, welcome, and the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, bro? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm just really uh, pleased to be a part of this workshop. And I'm really thrilled that so many people, so many smart people are focusing on this topic because it is an important topic. And sorry. Um, start of my presentation. And it's great for the, the University of Toronto's trash team has put this workshop on. Technical issues, sorry. Um, 
So I started this company back in 2007. And back then it didn't seem like there was nearly the focus that there is on it today. And I started it because I had been working in, in Baltimore Harbor for nearly 20 years. And on a daily basis, I would see scenes like this. The trash was really having a tremendous negative impact on the harbor. Baltimore has a beautiful harbor, but uh, when you when trash impairs it like this, it's really hard to see the beauty of the harbor beyond the uh, the ugliness of the trash. So I was I even called the city and I said, you know, we need to do something more about trash in the harbor. And to their credit, they said, you know, we're open to ideas. So every day on my way to work, I would think about what could we do to help this problem and, and start trapping the trash. And it became very clear that the trash was not coming from people walking around the harbor throwing their trash in the harbor. It was coming from the land and it could carried by the stormwater down into the, uh, into the harbor. So one day on my way to work, it occurred to me, why don't we use the flow of that stormwater to power a machine that can help us pick up that trash? So the idea of the water wheel powered trash interceptor was, was born. And the, my, my very first sketch was on a cocktail napkin at a party. But the next, but the next iteration was one you're seeing on your screen, um, a, a little more sophisticated, but still pretty primitive. And then my next step was to make a uh, a small working model, and I invited the city to come check out my small working model, and they said, "Well, we like the idea, but it's still kind of experimental, so we don't really have a mechanism for funding an experiment." So I went to the Waterfront Park, uh, I'm sorry, then went to the Able Foundation, a local foundation that's dedicated to improving Baltimore. And they said that they were willing to finance a prototype. So in 2008, we put in the first, world's first water wheel powered trash interceptor in Baltimore Harbor. And they, the, this prototype, we learned a lot from it. The first thing we learned is the job could be done. And the second thing we learned is that it, the concept was valid. The, the harder lessons were that the problem was a lot bigger and a lot more challenging than we had anticipated. And we were going to need a bigger, stronger, faster machine to be the permanent installation in the harbor. But the, even the prototype made a huge difference in the, in the conditions in the harbor. And that improvement was no, noticed by the people that live, work, and recreate on the harbor, odors, everybody who walks around the promenade notice that, wow, this trash wheel sure is making a difference. And an organization called the Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore took it upon themselves to lobby for a permanent trash wheel to be installed in the harbor. And the city was strapped for cash. The city said, well, we can't pay for it. So they raised money and they got a couple of major grants to fund the first permanent trash wheel in the harbor, as it's come to be known. And it sits at the mouth of the Jones Falls River, which is the largest tributary to Baltimore's inner harbor. And it drains a large portion of Baltimore City and Baltimore County. And when it rains, all the trash that's on the land and in, in all that land area in the streets, the parking lots, the alleys, gets washed down into the small streams of the storm drains and makes its way into the river. And it goes to the harbor through the Jones Falls River. So at the mouth of the Jones Falls River, we're able to take what is a non-point source pollution and turn it into a point source pollution to a certain extent, because all the trash that's coming from all those diverse areas ends up coming through a waterway that is about 30 meters wide. So in this, what the trash wheel is able to do is we use containment booms to funnel the trash on the, that's flowing down the river to the rakes and the conveyors and the the machine and the rakes and the conveyors, the rakes push the trash up onto the conveyor. The conveyor submerged at its, at its upstream end. 
so that the trash can flow up onto it with, with the assistance of the rakes, and then it can lift it and remove it from the water as it comes. And the rakes and the conveyors gets, get all their energy from a water wheel. And the water wheel is um, powered by two sources. One, the flow of the river that brings the trash. When there's usually when there's a lot of trash, we also have a lot of flow. So therefore, the water wheel can take advantage of that flow, provide more power to assist in um, picking up that trash. And then the rotation of the water wheel is connected by a series of chains, belts, sprockets, gears, and pulleys to get the power to the conveyor and the rakes. When there's not enough flow in the river, we supplement that flow with solar panels. The solar panels charge banks of batteries. So on the sunny days, we're able to store the sunny days for the rainy days. And these batteries power pumps and the pumps pump water up into the buckets of the water wheel. The weight of the water turns the wheel and that turning of the wheel get, provides the power for the rakes and the conveyors and mechanical systems on the machine. The conveyor then dumps the trash into a dumpster. The dumpster is actually on a separate floating bar as it slides in a bay underneath the conveyor. And we have two dumpster barges and three dumpsters for each of our trash wheels so that when one dumpster is full, we're able to bring out an empty dumpster on another dumpster barge, slide the full dumpster out, put the empty dumpster in. Then we take the full dumpster to a boat ramp where a truck meets us and does the same thing. They'll trade out a full, a full dumpster for an empty dumpster. That way, as a dumpster is being filled, the other dumpster can be, can be being emptied. And when the full dumpster is ready to be removed, we have an empty dumpster to uh, fit in. We have changed as many as 12 dumpsters in one day, and they hold as much as five tons of trash. So that's uh, um, one heck of a lot of trash for a storm event. And we're getting rain today in Baltimore, so we're going to be we're filling dumpsters as we speak. So all of the system of using a water wheel and a conveyor, that's all pretty low tech, um, ancient technology. I mean, water wheels have been important sources of uh, power for industry for centuries. Uh, we do have some more modern elements to the system. One is we're not hooked up to any electrical grid. We don't have any gas motors on board, but we do have an internet connection. And the internet connection allows us to do a couple of things. One, we have cameras that can see how full the dumpster is, can see how much trash is in front of it, can see how the machine is running. And that way we're able to monitor the machine without having to go out there and see what's going on. We, have, uh, we can constantly look at it to see whether the dumpster needs to be changed or if we need to activate the solar powered pumps. And if we do need to activate the solar powered pumps, we can actually do that from our smartphones via a web relay. That, um, so from anywhere there's internet, anywhere in the world, we can turn on and off the trash wheel and pick up trash without having to actually go there. You know, the only time we really have to go there for the most part is when there's a full dumpster that needs to be closed. So here is a quick time-lapse video of the machine in action. And you can see and it's picking up a lot of plastic and styrofoam. And if you look really closely, you might be able to make out that there's also thousands of cigarette butts in that mix as well. And other tiny bits of bottle caps and other plastic. There's also a lot of organic debris that comes down the river. This uh, video is actually sped up a little bit. The Machine moves pretty slowly. It can move a lot of trash at a time, but it does it at a fairly slow rate. It takes about an hour and a half, two hours to fill one of our dumpsters, which is about, average is about three and a half tons. We've had as much as five tons in the, in the dumpster. 
but it's actually good that it moves slowly because uh, it's if you move too fast, you actually have much more of a chance to pick, to disturb or pick up aquatic life like fish and other things that are in the water. Moving slowly, the aquatic animals have a chance to get out of the catchment area and escape. So we, we virtually never pick up any aquatic animals. So there's, doing it this way has a lot of benefits and I'm not gonna go through each one of these in order to stay on schedule, but I wanted to highlight just a couple of them. The fourth one provides an attractive point of interest. It's not very often that a, a solid waste management tool becomes a tourist attraction and the trash wheels have really become tourist attractions. People travel from miles around from great distance actually to come see it in action and they'll sit there for hours at a time watching it do its job and um, so it's it's kind of unique in that way but it also affords an opportunity to educate people about the problem of plastic pollution and stormwater pollution and inspire them to become part of the solution so having an attractive piece of equipment that's interesting has really I, I think uh, multiplied the benefits of the trash wheel. It's not measured just in the number of tons of trash you pick up or the millions of cigarette butts that you pick up. It's measured also in the number of people you get involved in becoming part of the series. The next one, uh, Allison and Chelsea talked about, it's really important to inform policy decisions and to understand the problem that we're able to quantify and analyze the composition of what we're collecting. It's really nice to know if Maryland just instituted a styrofoam ban based on a lot on the data that we provided as what's picked up by the different crash wheels. And it's nice to be able to see that amount of styrofoam as a, as a proportion of the trash that we pick up going down as a result of that styrofoam ban. So having that data not only helps advocate for changes in policy, but it also helps understand what you are accomplishing when you do those upstream efforts, whether it's street sweeping, styrofoam bans, bag taxes, bottle bills. So that's a really important piece of the of understanding what trapping trash brings to the table. And it's made a huge difference in Baltimore Harbor just from a, from a casual observer's point of view. And we, before we installed, just a couple of weeks before we installed the trash, the trash wheel in 2014, we had a storm that was, was we called the spring flush and the harbor was, just a mess for, for days on end after it was trash was spread out all over the harbor, as you can see in the upper right hand picture. A similar storm happened a year later after the trash was uh, trash wheel was in action. And the harbor was much, much cleaner, and the trash wheel got on a heck of a workout and picked up I think nearly 50 tons that day. So it's uh, you know, it comes. So there's many, many days where the trash wheel's picking up just a tiny bit of trash and it's all rain related and it's uh, other days when it's working hard. And all that hard work is measured in tons and it would pick up nearly 3 million pounds of trash with just the uh, Mr. Trash Wheel so far. And we do the estimates to quantify what's in those 3 million pounds of trash. And as you can see, there's plastic bottles over a million poly, uh, styrofoam containers over a million, 12 million cigarette butts. And we do this, we get these estimates via sampling, but we also have dumpster dives where volunteers will actually spend a Saturday going through the awful mess that we have in our dumpsters and more than 100 people will volunteer to come down and count item by item each of the things that we've collected with the trash wheel in a full dumpster and this is a great thing to do 
to verify the sampling methods. And what we found is that the, the dumpster dives results correlate pretty closely with our sampling methods. So that gives us confidence in our, in our methods. And, in, and having these people uh, volunteer also builds a, a, a tight uh, relationship between people and their trash wheel. So the success of Mr. Trash Wheel has now generated more trash wheels in Baltimore Harbor. Uh, Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore had put in Professor Trash Wheel, working with us to put in Professor Trash Wheel in 2016. And the state of Maryland, the Maryland Port Administration made Captain Trash Wheel uh, the next year. And we're excited. And each one of these has their own personality. I mean, I originally, uh, it was not part of my original concept that they would each have a personality and a, and a Twitter feed and an Instagram feed and a Facebook page. But, and, and, and to tell you the truth, I was originally a little skeptical about putting real googly eyes on the machine because this is a serious piece of equipment doing serious work. And I was a little afraid that people would think it's sort of a gimmick or a joke, but it's, it's you know, these things are working hard doing a very hard job. But I've come to realize that having, that instead of taking away from how people perceive it, it's really enhancing the way people perceive it. They're, they're understanding that Mr. Trash Wheel is doing a really important job and they're connecting to the trash wheels. And through that connection, they're becoming involved in being a part of the solution. And now we're welcoming the fourth trash wheel to Baltimore Harbor, which will be installed in just the next few weeks. It's just it's complete and ready to go. We're just ready, scheduling the pile driving for the installation and it'll be hard at work. The uh, there was a naming contest to come up with the name for it. And because it's going in the Gwynns Falls River, which is a major tributary to the west side of Baltimore, um, when the, the Good Wheel of the West was selected from hundreds and hundreds of names that were, su that were submitted by um, the public to, and it was voted on, and this was the name that was chosen. So it's a reference to the Wizard of Oz and to its location. And um, this is a quick video of it in action. One thing I wanted to point out, if you notice this is a little different than the earlier video that I showed you. We're constantly working on improving the technology and coming up with ways to, to enhance its performance. The rake system on this one is a different design. The other rake system works great for most of the flows of trash that we get. But when we have a really hard storm, what happens is the trash gets packed up in front of the machine and it forms almost the sticks and leaves and trash form almost what looks like a beaver dam. And those, the other rake style had a hard time breaking that beaver dam up and getting it to feed onto the conveyor. So we spent a fair amount of time with manually intervening and get it broken up so that the earth can start feeding it. And the concept here is that this style rake will do a better job breaking up that, that packed pile after a hard storm. And we'll let you know how it performs in the next couple of, after we get it installed and working. But we're optimistic and I'm pretty confident that it's gonna be a good improvement. So everything that the trash wheel uh, it has done, has led to a, a, a fan following, particularly in Baltimore, but there are trash wheel fans all over the world who follow it on Facebook and Twitter. And in Baltimore, you can buy three different types of trash wheel beer. You can get a trash wheel t-shirt and stickers. You can even get a little stuffed trash wheel plushie. And if you're really inspired, you can dress up as a trash wheel for Halloween. And each year there's been a trash wheel fan fest. We didn't do it last year because of the pandemic, but people get to get, hundreds of people get together as a 
fan fest and celebrate all things trash wheel. They have trash wheel songs and trash wheel cakes and trash wheel art. There's trash wheel stained glass. Um, and it, I never in my wildest dreams did I think that this idea I was sketching on a, a cocktail napkin would lead to this, but I'm uh, humbled that it did. The other thing that the Waterfront Partnership did is they wanted to take this trash wheel fandom and turn it into action. So they formed a secret society, which is a not so secret society called the Order of the Wheel. In order to join the Order of the Wheel, you have to take some environmental actions that justify your induction into the secret order of the trash wheel. And those actions can include tree planting, they can include recycling efforts, they can include uh, roadside cleanups, those types of things. So hundreds of people have now been inducted into the order of the wheel. So we're able to take this trash wheel fandom and the fact that the trash wheel has attracted so much attention and turn it into action by, uh, by these, these people who follow the trash wheels. And this is some particularly rewarding when you see the young generation becoming part of the solution. We've had Lego trash wheels, robotics clubs have made their own style trash wheel. We've had kids have lemonade stands so that they can raise money for the next trash wheel. And I've got, I just find that so rewarding. And I think, you know, I thought when we started this, the best thing that can come out of it is we'll be able to look out and see a cleaner harbor. But when you see things like this, and there's a flotilla held each year where kayakers and canoers and other boaters get together to lobby for clean water action. And the trash wheel is the centerpiece of that. Um, that's equally as rewarding as seeing a lot less trash in the harbor. And some of this has been tougher during the pandemic, but you can still celebrate your trash wheel fandom by wearing your Mr. Trash Wheel face mask. So we, we're adapting. And the, when I started this, I was really thinking very locally. And what I came to find out as soon as the trash wheel sort of went viral, I came to find out, I, I, I suspected it, but it, it became very aware of the fact that Baltimore is not unique. Uh, we've been to Indonesia, Costa Rica, Brazil, all over the world after, after the trash wheel um, gained this international attention. People say, we want a trash wheel in our river. And the trash is the same everywhere. Some places have more of it, some places have less of it, but it's all plastic bottles, styrofoam cups. It all looks just like what we pick up in Baltimore Harbor. And it's truly is a global problem. And the trash wheel, you know, we're working to bring the trash wheel to other places. We're working with a great group in Panama City, Panama, called Marea Verde. And they've assembled a great team um, to bring a trash wheel to a river in Panama City. We're working in Newport Beach, California on design for a trash wheel installation in San Diego Creek. We're working in Fort Worth, Texas. So we're expanding beyond Baltimore and we're excited to do that. Uh, we do always stress though, as Kelsey said in the beginning that, you know, this is a piece of the puzzle. There, it's got to be complemented by be policy changes, behavior changes, economic incentives that help reduce the need for these uh, types of equipment. Um, so there's, you're not gonna solve the problem with trash interceptors alone, but they certainly are, are a key element of the project and uh, that's getting us to the solution to the problem. So with that, thank you very much. And I would look forward to any questions you might have. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. okay close to my schedule. Okay, thank you, John, so much. Uh, it was great to hear from Trashville, Mr. Trashville, Professor Trashville. Uh, we are a little bit behind the schedule, so now we have the break. So uh, everybody, everyone is um, welcome to take their breaks. Uh, we will be here. John, if you don't mind, would you 
uh, we will stay here for questions. So if you want to uh, answer any questions, I will share here my, my slide very quickly to show just in case if you're not familiar with uh, Zoom, how you use it. So here, if you want to do a, a question, you can ask a question out loud and use the uh, raise your hand feature that you can find in the reactions menu. Uh, and or you can tap your uh, type your question in the chat. I will stop in here. So let me see if we have any questions. Otherwise, we will go back. We will be back on uh, two twenty-five. So we will have a ten minutes break. Let me see if we have any questions. I don't. I don't see any hands. Up. We have um, some chat questions. Okay, so, so Kathy, you can read one for John. Okay, John. great. So our first question is from Gloria. She asks, how much did it cost to make the trash mill or the trash wheel? Trash wheel. John, uh, you can turn on your camera if you want to. As well. Okay, that's a very good question. The trash wheels are obviously range in, in cost depending on the size of the waterway they're in. Uh, the smallest one we've built, uh, Captain Trash Wheel, is about a $400,000 project. And that includes not just the trash wheel, but the installation, the booms that are needed for it. So it's really soup to nuts of, all the way from design to test operation. Um, the most expensive one we're working on is actually the one out in Newport Beach, California, where they're, need, they're needing to develop a lot of land side uh, support structure because they can't take the uh, dumpsters to a boat ramp. And that one's going to be uh, $800,000 trash wheel piece plus some on the um, uh, land side development. Thank you. Uh, Cassie, do we have other questions from the chat? We do. Thank you very much. Yes, we do. So we have another one following from July. Um, they ask, do these only work well in a river situation? Are they fit for more open bay slash harbor situations? Uh, the key thing is that the trash has to come to the trash wheel is not a boat. It doesn't go around. It sits on, it's permanently moored so that it's there when the trash is coming. And it doesn't have to be, have an operator on it. So if there's a situation where the trash, there's a natural flow of trash in a certain direction, then the trash wheel can be effective. Obviously rivers, there's not a lot of trash going upstream. In fact, it, the net flow is always downstream. So you're always able to intercept the trash as it's headed downstream. Um, when you get out into open waters like uh, Arbor or a bay is that the trash is often not headed in just one direction. Um, but if, if it could be identified that the, there is a certain flow, the other thing you have to be conscious of is navigation. Um, when you have containment booms, obviously it's a restriction for uh, boat traffic. So. There are ways to accommodate the boat traffic around the containment booms, but um, those are the challenges you have of putting it out in open water like a lake or a bay or a harbor. Excellent. And if does anyone uh, wants to do a question like out loud with microphone, you just need to raise your hands in the uh, with the reaction uh, feature. Otherwise, we will read another question from the chat. Cassie, do we have another question? Oh, we we have do. We have one from Janet. She says, I need a mini version, perhaps something area um, for high school students could build. Any info? So maybe she's looking for some resources. Well, we'd be happy to talk to her high school class if they seriously want to take on that uh, project. And mini version, we thought about mini versions. And mini versions, I do think that there could be an application for mini versions in a lot of different places. Um, and I think, you know, if you find the right waterway, there's really no lower limit. In theory, there's no upper limit to how 
big or small, you can make a trash wheel and still have it effectively pick up trash. Um, so it's totally scalable. And if you would like to contact us um, and talk about that, we'd be love to talk to you about that. Amazing. Uh, oh, we have one uh, male fault. I will unmute you. You can unmute yourself. How does that work? Okay, worry. Go ahead. We hear that this uh, trash wheel picks up all this trash. What do you do with the trash once you get it picked up? That's a very good question. We have uh, worked with a number of different organizations to try to get the recyclables out of them and uh, take the, you know, uh, segregate it to what's recyclable and what's not. That's proved to be very difficult. We sent trash to Germany to have BMW was interested in helping us with that to see if they could recycle some of it in their car parts and lubricants or things like that. Um, I think when we sent those five big barrels of trash, I just pictured German scientists opening it up and going, what the hell did these Americans send us? <laughs> and, and send it back, because um, it's pretty nasty stuff. So the, currently the trash is goes to a waste to energy facility where it is incinerated to generate electricity. Um, that has obviously some benefits and a lot of environmental uh, concerns as well. But it's, um, it's uh, we're just doing our best to try to solve the problem of getting it out of the river and getting it disposed of. And that's what the city does with it. And it's, um, you know, at least it's becoming energy. Um, so we're trying to do, come up with other, in, in the Panama project that we're working on, we're going to be segregating it for recyclables. Um, if possible, their, their trash has a much higher percentage of fresh recyclable plastic than a lot of those trash that we pick up is highly degraded and commingled with a lot of organic material as well. Thank you, John. Uh, Kyle, you have uh, time for one more question from the chat. Okay. So we have a question from Cody that says, that's impressive that volunteer groups um, will sort through the dumpster for you. Can you order a trash wheel? Is there a trash wheel shop? Yeah, I'm sitting in the trash wheel shop. Um, you can order a trash wheel from Clearwater Mills. And um, we have lots, we've had hundreds and hundreds of inquiries about trash wheels and one of the challenges that we face is that the status quo has always been easy, which is let the trash go on by downstream and become somebody else's problem. It does take a very dedicated organization to take on ownership of all the trash that's coming down your river. And that is, you know, some organizations are old and brave enough to, and to take on that. And I'm very grateful that I live in Baltimore where there was organizations who are ready to try something new and solve the problem and work with us to develop this technology, the Waterfront Partnership with Baltimore, the Able Foundation, the City of Baltimore have all been great partners. But that's what it takes because you're gonna own 200, you know, hundreds of tons of trash each year. You gotta figure out how to deal with it. And you have a machine that's going to sit there through 365 days a year and you've got to be ready to operate it even on uh, holidays and weekends. So it's a big task to take on, but uh, we're ready to we'll, we'll work with any organization that wants to take on that task. Um, and uh, we'd love to hear from organizations as well work with us to help clean any rivers. Okay, John, thank you so much for your time. It was, uh, was amazing. I enjoy a lot. I hope all the other attendees are here uh, enjoy as well. So if you have questions, uh, I think they can contact 
John directly uh, with more information about the trash wheel. You can search on, um, we will put in the chat the uh, clean, uh, your companies and maybe your email or any contact that you would like to share with us. Uh, thank you, John. So now we, I hope uh, people here, they have time to go to the washroom and uh, get a very quick bre break. Now I'll pass to Chelsea. We will have the Meet Other Trash Trapping Technologies. Uh, so we have a lot of more uh, other technology to discuss. So thank you so much, John. Uh, Chelsea, it's... Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, please share my info with the, with the folks who are interested. Uh, you can share my direct email and be happy to discuss it with Okay, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, John, so much for being here. And thanks, everyone, for allowing us to power through a break. Um, of course, you're welcome to get up at any time. We just wanted to make sure there was still time for Q&A with, with John and also to stay on time. So now we're going to go on to our next session. I'm going to share my screen quickly just to sort of say what it is and why, why it is. Um, and then I'm going to introduce our panel. So the purpose of this session is to introduce you to some of the other flavors of trash trapping devices. Um, so here we'll have a few speakers that will introduce some of these devices to you and also their stories in working with these technologies. So they will share why they invented them or why they're using them. Um, but before we dive in, I, I want to just provide just kind of a quick introduction to this session and the diversity of trash trapping devices. I'm also briefly going to touch upon the things to think about as you might pick uh, the right one for your purpose, which we'll discuss in a lot more detail tomorrow. So first of all, I just want to remind you the value of trash trapping, and these are cleanup, data collection, and community outreach. So depending on your goals, there might be a trash trap that is best for you based on each of these three factors. For example, if you need to pick up a lot of large items, a smaller trap might not be for you. Or if public outreach is really, really important, you might want a trap that's incredibly visible and potentially with googly eyes. The good news is, is that there are many different types of traps out there. Each of the trapping, the data collection, and the outreach can be accomplished with an array of different technologies. And there's no one size fits all solution, which is something we've learned here in the Toronto Harbor. And what you may pick may depend on many factors that I just described. They might be locations, they might be costs. And in general, you'll want to choose a trap that, that we say is fit for purpose. So things to consider might be where you want to clean up. Is it a beach? Is it a harbor? Is it a river? Uh, what you want to clean up, the size of the trash, how much trash, and also your budget. Of course, different technologies cost different, different amounts of money. And so you're going to hear a lot more about this tomorrow as in a deeper dive from Cassie. But again, the purpose of this session, and of course also hearing from John Kellett, is to introduce you to some of the trash traps that are out there, as well as the vision and the story behind them. Because people didn't tend to develop this technology solely because of profit. They really developed them because of part, and for that same passion of wanting to help solve this issue, which many of us in this room share. So we're gonna hear a bit about some of their informational stories, but before we meet our panel, um, I wanna acknowledge that we know that there are many people in this room using trash traps around the world. And we would have loved to have given time and, and microphone and space to everybody, but we only had uh, two days of two half day workshops. So what I wanna do is instead just share a Mentimeter, um, similar to what Susan did, I'll share the link in a second, to get an understanding from those in the room are you, how many of you are using a trap? What sorts of traps are you using? And what's the type of, um, of water body that you might be using them in? So I'm gonna share a link right now in the chat. I'm also gonna share the Mentimeter on a screen and on it, you'll be able to see the passcode. So you can either click the link or go to menti.com and use this code 837824. And you will start answering the first question, which is if you have a trash trap, what kind are you using? Now this is going to show up like a word cloud. So the bigger the word, the more people are using that type of trap. Uh, the more words, the more diversity of traps that we have in this room. And of course, yes, there's going to be some people that are not using one yet um, and that are here to learn more about them, which is great. 
So we've got, we've got some none, which is good. It's good to see, right? How many people are here to learn, to think about new types of traps? How many of people here are using different traps? How many people here are inventing different types of traps? Awesome. Okay, so right now you can see quite a few sea bins, some gutter bins and litter traps. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to go ahead to the second question. And you're welcome, you can keep on this question, but I'm gonna open up the second one if you're done, which is what type of water body are you currently cleaning in? So are you focused in a river, a harbor, open water, a storm drain, or maybe it's other. For example, uh, one of the speakers today is gonna to talk about putting trash traps at uh, plastic industries. So I actually see some others. And I can tell you, you know, fit for purpose is important. When we first started, we, we had a design as Raphaela showed for a trash wheel, but the Don River where we wanted to put it is under construction and there was no way that was gonna happen in the next five years. So right now we have sea bins which work well in the Harbor. So thinking about the type of location you wanna put it is really important uh, in terms of thinking about what's fit for purpose for your, your solution. So Bit of a diversity here, less in open water, which is fair. I think that's hard. Um, but for that person who is who is doing it in open water, if you want to share in the chat uh, the type of trap, I would certainly be interested. Uh, what kind of trap is working well in open water? Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everybody for filling that out. You can see my ugly screen as I switch in between. Okay, so now I'm actually going to go ahead and introduce our panel. So for the next rest of the session, each is gonna give about a 10 minute presentation and then we'll have time for a question and answer. So first we're gonna hear from Michael Hanna about the Lita trap, a trap that collects debris from storm drains and is in use in many places around the world. Then you'll hear from Gautier Pierce of Water Products and Solutions. His company sells sea bins, but is also creating other types of traps that he'll share with us for use in different types of locations. And then last but not least, you'll hear from Molly Morse, who works for the Benioff Ocean Initiative. She's helping lead a project that involves many different types of river traps uh, in large rivers around the world. And this includes the work we're doing in Vietnam, but also work in a lot of locations with some of the largest outputs of litter uh, from rivers to our oceans. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And Mike, over to you if you wanna share your screen and turn your camera and uh, unmute yourself. How's that? Is that all working? I can hear you. Yep. Great. Thanks, Chelsea. And uh, thank you to the Trash Team of Toronto University to, to, for inviting me to this workshop. It's a great initiative. So I'm Mike Hanna. I'm one of the founders of Enviropod. I'm a stormwater engineer and I come from New Zealand, which is a group of islands in the South Pacific. So as such, I'm really connected to the ocean. Um, I've also spent some time in Ontario, Canada and have a great love for Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes of, of North America. Today I'm going to talk about some outreach projects that Enviropod has been doing around the world to and what we're doing to help stop marine plastic. All these projects use our technology, the litter trap, which sits inside catch basins, stormwater catch basins, which are typically on the road or in your car park or in your factory or school or everywhere that there's an impermeable surface. Mike, I'm gonna stop you for one second. Do you have a PowerPoint? Because if you do, we can't see it. And I think you are muted. I don't know if I accidentally did that to you. Oh, can you see that now? No, okay. I see you. Right. You look great, but we can't Thank see your you. slides. <laughs> Uh, let's, there we go. There that you was, go. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Right. Yeah. So that was my first slide. I'll jump to my second slide. So the research has shown that, that marine plastic is, is really a largely a land-based problem. 80% of, of, of marine plastic comes from the land. And as mentioned previously, the stormwater drains are one of the main transport routes from the land to the ocean, to the lakes, to our streams. 
And really, most people don't know this. Um, it's surprising the stormwater people have been talking a lot about the, the risks of stormwater, but most populations don't, don't actually understand that those drains on the side of the road go straight to the ocean. I really don't think most people intentionally litter. I think that one of the biggest issues and challenges is that there's so much plastic in our world and our life that it's constantly being shed as people do things, as people work, as people go to school, as people go shopping, there's always small bits of plastic being dropped on the ground. And when it rains, it, it makes it to the stormwater drain and straight off to the harbour. So our outreach programs are really about going back up into the catchment um, and trying to identify the sources, uh, the, the highest generating trash generating sources within the catchment and working with the people and the activities around them to reduce those high pollutant loads and stop them going down the storm drains. So just quickly to introduce who uh, Enviropod is. Uh, well, we've actually been around since 1996 uh, we are part of a company, that's me here in the photo, straight out of university with a bit of an afro and flair, so that was how long ago it was. And that's me developing and working on the first Enviropod litter trap that we did. Stormwater 360 does all sorts of work that uh, we do underground filters to remove dissolved heavy metals and nutrients. We also do green roofs to absorb stormwater. We do have an extensive R&D and testing program and we have tested the litter trap in laboratories in, in New Zealand and in Canada. Our real goal with, with developing the litter trap was to make an accessible solution to property owners or, or infrastructure owners to manage their own personal uh, plastic footprint, to not let it wash down their stormwater drain and let someone else deal with it down, downstream. And so far, we've been very successful. We've got approximately 50,000 units installed through New Zealand, Australia, Canada. And we just recently uh, um, started offering our technology in the USA. And we have the Californian Water Board approval as a full trap capture trash control device. So here's the litter trap. Um, essentially, it's a basket and a drain, but um, it's a very well engineered basket and a drain. And the whole point of us when we designed it, it was to make something that was really easy to use, easy to install and easy to maintain. And I think we've succeeded because some of the case studies I'll show you later, even children can maintain this device. It was designed to not cause flooding and also designed to be emptied um, when it's full, completely full of material because it will quite often get completely full of material. Um, if you wanna know more about the technical aspects, you can follow up with my email or look at our website after this presentation. So the first tech case study I'm gonna talk about is the, the Waiheke Litter Capture Project. Waiheke Island is a, is a urban island in the harbour of Auckland City, New Zealand's largest, uh, largest city. And the Waiheke Community Board, which is part of the city council, wanted to do an investigation into the where the trash and debris and litter was coming from and, and what hotspots. So we installed 35 litter traps throughout the island and we monitored it for over a year. We worked with the University of Auckland with a couple of students to monitor, do the collection and monitoring. And it was uh, quite a huge effort from these three people. The whole point of the exercise was really to bring more awareness um, of, of trash and plastic pollution because um, obviously what are the effects it's having on, on the Pacific Ocean. The, everyone knows about the Great Pacific Garbage, garbage Patch in the, in the North Pacific, but there's also one in the South Pacific between New Zealand and Chile. So just making people aware of that was one of the key outcomes of this project. So some of the stats, whoops, some of the stats we got over the year, we caught over 25,000 pieces of litter. As I said, it was quite a huge effort from the sorting team with over 500 hours of sorting, but there was a lot of learnings as we, we actually did this project. Initially, we were trying to separate plastic, organics and sediment because there's a lot of sediment and organics in stormwater runoff. And we were washing every piece of plastic and every leaf off, washing all the sediment off them. So that took up about 300 hours on our first two, um, two sorts. So we decided we'll just stop doing that because it was taking too much time. 
Um, on average, there was about 834 pieces of litter caught per trap per year. Um, and the biggest and nastiest pollutant, well, the biggest pollutant we caught was our good old friend, the cigarette butts. And I, I see that in, in John's presentation previously. Um, so yeah, it was over the period of the time, there was 325 empties of the litter traps during the, the, the one year. We emptied them roughly every six weeks. So there was a quite an interesting data came out. We found that there were definitely hot spots that were generating most of the litter. Um, eight out of the 35 litter traps caught over 15% of the material. And these were typically in land uses such as retail or commercial areas, um, transport stops like the bus stop or the ferry, ferry terminal, and also um, lakeside parks, or not lakeside, oceanside parks where people would go and have a picnic and congregate and hang out. Basically, wherever human activity was, there was a higher source of trash and debris going down the stormwater drain. We did a lot of analysis of the types of plastics and we followed you know, international protocols and in categorizing them. And as and cigarette butts made up 32% of, of what we were capturing. The next was hard plastics and soft plastics around 12, 13%. And these were generally associated with packaging material. Um, plastic bags weren't really as much of a factor because we have got a plastic bag ban now, but there was a lot of packaging material, cling film and stuff in the soft plastic area. A lot of the hard plastics were also broken up and in smaller pieces as like vehicles would drive over a plastic container um, and, and break it. We also found money as well in the uh, litter traps, which kind of was an indication to us again that not all littering is intentional because why would you throw away money? Um, there's a couple of other surprises. You know, typically our wettest area seasons are, are winter and spring, yet those were the seasons where we had the least amount of trash being caught. The autumn and summer, when the water's warmer around the island, is when you get the most tourists coming to the island, and that is when we found the highest amount of trash and debris in our traps. So again, it's kind of, well, it is a stormwater problem, it is also a human problem. So the other so Waiheke is a great example of a public outreach program, but we've also been doing a lot of outreach with businesses. We have joined non-for-profit business sustainability organizations like the Sustainable Business Network in New Zealand or Partners Green in Toronto. And we work with their members to do studies and identify the pollution loading from different sorts of industry. And we've had some great corporates join us such as large supermarket change, car dealerships, building supply companies. There's been quite a few good, play, um, good corporates joining us. Here's just some of the pictures of the outreaches with businesses. We usually start with a bit of a pilot sort of study uh, where we'll put three or four uh, traps in around a supermarket or a factory. And we'll work with the owners and the staff to show them what it is, how to maintain it and how to empty it and, and get them to start looking at what we're catching. And again, it's the usual sort of suspects. It's the packaging material and it's the, 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 the food wrappers that we're capturing. And we find that there's an engaging with the workers and the owners that this message that the stormwater drains is draining to the harbour is actually quite surprising and new. Most people still think that it goes to some sort of sewage treatment plant. And we have also have been working with the Plastics Industry Association in New Zealand and Canada. Um, and really targeting the whole supply chain of plastic pallets. These plastic pallets are on every beach in the world, but if you've ever worked with them and spilt them, they're incredibly hard to manage. You use a broom and you sweep it and they take off and they run away. And they're only one to two millimeters in size, so they're really difficult to manage. So we've been targeting the transport. They are transported in huge amounts of quantities around the planet. And they're also used by large corporates for manufacturing, but also small mum and dad sort of operations. So simple low cost solutions is what these people are looking for. 
Um, there's more about uh, some of the projects we've done by Neil Menzies from Eco Compass and the Canadian Plastics Association later in uh, the workshop. I've just got to turn these things off. <sighs> Sorry. And is that, I hope that's not on everyone's screen, my, myself, but anyway. It's gone, it's gone now, Mike. Yeah, cool, thanks. <laughs> Um, and, and the lastly, the, one of the last case studies is the work we do with environmental educators. And this the next few slides are actually a, a booklet produced by the University of, not the University, the um, Ministry of Education in New Zealand. It's a booklet that is trying to empower students to do outreach and action projects themselves. And it's about the story of our, our work with these um, environmental educators. These three children, Ethan, Jenna, and, e and Harvey, were the um, went snorkeling with Mountains to Sea, the environmental educator. They went to a marine reserve and a non-marine reserve, and, and Mountains to Sea really highlighted, you know, look at the impacts of trash on our waterway. And they, these, these three kids were quite concerned about that, and they really wanted to work and tell people, you know, what's going on, tell people in their community. So, they reached out to us and said, can we have some of your litter traps? We want to show the public and our community you know, what's going down these stormwater drains. And we said, sure, we'll help you with that. And we, we gave them two litter traps. They put one in right in the middle of the township and one more of in a, re in a residential area. And they went out with their teacher and, and emptied these litter traps every, every couple of weeks, just encountered what they could find. And now doing this sort of analysis and, and, and engagement with the problem really crossed over with a lot of other parts of the school syllabus. They did some statistics and maths and calculus and sampling and subsampling. And they worked out that approximately half a million pieces of trash was going through their little town. And they were quite concerned about that, you know? And so they uh, held meetings with, with, the, with the council uh, and, and the local community boards, and they told everyone about what they were doing and they really that we really needed to do better. They did observe that in the residential areas, there wasn't much trash. And again, it was really in the city areas outside pubs and bars and cafes. And it was really impactful to these children and, 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 and it really meaningful as well as their parents and their community. And we were really, you know, really um, empowered by this and, and really wanting to support these environmental educators. And so we're working now with a number of different educators around the country and, and in different countries. And we've prepared a uh, education booklet to show you, to explain some of the, the, the factors or risks as well, of man maintaining a catch patient treatment device or trapping device, um, just because, you know, there are a few risks being on a road, there's often sharps, et cetera. But we also discuss in this document how you can enroll it and engage it, engage it with your school syllabus. So there's uh, my quick overview. There's obviously a lot more information all around that to that quick little presentation. Um, but yeah, please feel free to reach out to me if you want any more information about any of these projects. Thanks, Mike, awesome. If you wanna go ahead and take down your screen and then Gautier, I'm going to introduce you to turn or invite you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself and share your screen. And I'll probably, you each have 10 minutes. So Gautier, I might give you a one minute warning just so we can make sure we stay on time. Gautier, you there? Perfect. We see you. Can't hear you yet.
Katia, do you need anything from us? Can you hear us? Maybe what we'll do, Molly, if you're ready, I might turn it over to you to start and then we'll have Gautia go third. Sure, we can do that. Okay. Go ahead and share your screen and I'll, I'll give you a warning at about right at 10 minutes just in case you're going over. Okay, can you see my screen? Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Chelsea. And thanks, everyone, for having me here today. Um, again, I'm Molly Morse. I'm a project scientist, um, a marine scientist by training, and I work with the Benioff Ocean Initiative based in California. I'm happy to talk to you today about our Clean Currents Coalition project. So the Benioff Ocean Initiative was founded in 2016 at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And our goal is to promote science and tech-based tech ocean problem solving. We work closely with experts and practitioners who are using cutting edge science and technology to identify problems, research and test solutions, and ultimately replicate and scale those solutions. The Clean Currents Coalition began in 2018 with a workshop of experts to discuss the problem of plastic waste in the ocean and best strategies for how the Benioff Ocean Initiative and our team of collaborators could address it. In 2019, we released a request for proposals calling for projects that would address two main goals. The first being to develop and pilot plastic waste capture devices in rivers around the world to prevent plastic waste from reaching the ocean and the second to collect data about river plastic waste to contribute to scientific research, influence policy change, and empower communities to take action against plastic waste. Then in 2020, we launched the Clean Currents Coalition, which is a network of top projects that were selected to address the problem of plastic waste in rivers. The Clean Currents Coalition operate in nine river systems across four continents as depicted in this map here. Each project is led by a nonprofit or tech startup organization in collaboration with research, technology, and communications experts, taking a holistic approach to tackling this challenge. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about the range of different technologies that each of the Clean Currents Coalition projects are testing at each of these sites. Some of the Clean Currents Coalition members are on the call, and I hope some of you will get an opportunity to meet them and hear from them directly about their projects. Um, they are the ones who are the true experts, and I'm happy to be able to be here to share what they have been working on. So the first project I'll share about is in Panama, where we are working on the Juan Diaz River in Panama City. Uh, the Juan Diaz River is um, covering a large watershed in Panama City that covers trash from several residential neighborhoods into the coastal mangroves and to the Pacific Ocean. Marea Verde is an NGO organization focused on building awareness and taking action on solid waste pollution in the rivers and coasts in Panama and is our primary partner on the project in this location. Maria Verde has teamed up with the companies that created the Baltimore Trash Wheels to develop one of the first international adaptations of the technology. You're all familiar with it from John Kellett's presentation earlier today. And in addition to the familiar design of the trash wheels, the Panama design will incorporate a transverse conveyor system that will transport the waste to a shoreside processing site, which eliminates the need for floating dumpster barges. It will also allow continual removal of the waste and reduce labor requirements. Our next project site is in Ecuador and uh, it is on the Puerto Viejo River in Manabí province. Um, the Puerto Viejo River carries waste uh, throughout the province into the Pacific where it is dispersed by ocean currents uh, to places like the Galapagos Islands. Organization that leads this project is Ichthion, which is a company founded at Imperial College London and is led by a joint British Ecuadorian team that develops scalable technologies for reducing the flow of plastics to the ocean. In their plastic capture system called the Azure, the first 
phase, which is depicted in the upper picture and the picture on the left, was installed this past January and consists of a modular barrier whose size can be adapted to sites with different geometric constraints and can be easily replaced if damaged in an extreme event. It is a fixed barrier that extends across the river and also partway into the water column. The second phase of the system, which is depicted on the bottom right, is a solar powered material extraction conveyor that removes waste to the riverbank and is designed to cover the full tidal range of the river. The second phase will be installed in the next couple of months. In Indonesia, we're working on the Chitaram River uh, near the West Bandung Regency. Um, the Chitaram River is infamous for the amount of plastic waste that collects at uh, this particular location um, that is upstream near the urban areas above the large Saguling Dam. Our primary project partner in this location is Greeneration Foundation, which is an Indonesia-based NGO that focuses on sustainable consumption and production. And they are also supported by Partners Waste for Change and River Recycle. Their plastic capture system is called the River Cleaner, which was designed by River Recycle, a Finland-based startup, and consists of active concentration modules placed along the river to guide plastic and other waste to one side. So that's the, the blue band here. And then followed by an automatic conveyor that lifts the waste out of the river depicted in the top right and the bottom left. The system is designed to capture on average 20 to 100 metric tons of waste per day and is also modular so that it can be modified or repaired easily and allows for vessels and aquatic life to easily navigate around it. In Kenya, we are working on the Afigalana Sabaki River, um, both in Nairobi and out at the coast by the Indian Ocean. Uh, this particular river is the second longest in Kenya and receives a huge amount of pollution from the city of Nairobi, uh, which has a population of 9 million and is experiencing growing urbanization right now um, and where dumping into rivers is very common due to poor waste management services. Our primary project partners here are Kimulex Company Limited, which is a startup social enterprise, and Smart Villages Research Group, which is a nonprofit initiative that provides energy access solutions. These organizations have collectively installed five capture systems and intend to install a total over the next couple of years. Uh, and these are low cost and made locally, allowing for them to be easily replicated. They consist of both a passive element, which is a fixed permeable fence or a barrier that traps the debris, and also an electrically powered mechanical extraction system that uses a conveyor that can be switched on periodically to clear the collected waste from the barrier. Most of the units thus far have been designed for urban settings where electrical power sources are available for the conveyors, but this coming year, they plan to install more off-grid units in more remote sites. In Jamaica, we are working in Kingston Harbor near the city of Kingston. And there are several gullies and rivers that carry various types of waste into the harbor. When these gullies and rivers get clogged, it causes flooding, damaged infrastructure and mangroves, um, and ultimately carries trash out to delicate coral reef systems. So in Kingston, we're working with the Ocean Cleanup, which is a nonprofit based in the Netherlands that develops technologies to rid the world's oceans and rivers of plastic waste. You may be familiar with the Ocean Cleanup's flagship technology, the Interceptor, which consists of a solid barrier that concentrates floating debris toward an anchored catamaran vessel, which then lifts the debris out of the water using an autonomous solar powered conveyor belt. The debris are distributed over six dumpsters inside a pontoon, which are then extracted and taken to shore for emptying. In Jamaica, the Ocean Cleanup is currently studying the Kingston Harbor site to plan the most effective intervention approach. In Mexico, we're working in Los Lareles Canyon, which is a tributary of the Tijuana River in the city of Tijuana. Um, there is pretty poor waste collection in this particular neighborhood. And so a lot of environmental and public health effects result from dumping into the Tijuana River that's ultimately washed across the border, also into the United States and San Diego County. This project is led by our partner, 
Wild Coast, which is a nonprofit organization based in both California and Mexico that works to protect coastal and marine ecosystems. This past January, Wild Coast installed their device, uh, which is called a brute boom in Los Areles Canyon within this sediment basin that you can see in the image here. Water flow through the basin is precipitation dependent and in strong flows, the boom, which is attached to the basin wall, you can see here, um, moves up and down with the water level. A galvanized steel debris screen, you can see down here, stops the flow of suspended debris up to a half a meter below the surface of the flow of the water. Next, as Chelsea mentioned earlier, we are also working in Vietnam on the Song Hong, also known as the Red River in the city of Nam Dim. This is Vietnam's second largest river and it passes through both the capital of Hanoi and carries waste through a national park along the coast before it reaches the ocean. Our partners on this project are Ocean Conservancy, who you heard from earlier today, um, and also their local Vietnamese partner, the Center for Marine Life Conservation and Community Development, also known as MCD, and the University of Toronto team led by Chelsea. This particular device is a trash trap, which has two boom arms that extend to passively guide plastic waste carried on the surface into the trap, which is anchored on the river bottom along the side of the river. It's constructed entirely of locally sourced inexpensive materials. And it also has a fence barrier that prevents trash from escaping when the tide reverses, you can see here. And also a signal buoy, which allows um, safe passage of vessels. This particular device was installed in January and the team is planning to install four more over the next few years. Last but not least, in Thailand, uh, we are working in the Lat Prao Canal in Bangkok. Um, the canal is a section of the Chao Phraya River, which is one of the longest and most polluted rivers in this country. The project is led by our partner TerraCycle Global Foundation, which was established by the recycling company TerraCycle Inc., which is a world leader in circular economy through collecting and recycling traditionally non-recyclable materials. Similar to the Ocean Conservancy's trash trap, the trash trap here in Thailand has two boom arms with nets suspended below them to guide waste into a metal collection trap. The trap itself is detachable to allow easy movement and maintenance and is typically ev emptied every few days by boat. It's locally produced, um, has been shown to be safe for aquatic life and well suited to narrow waterways with high boat traffic. TerraCycle Global Foundation has installed three of these devices in Bangkok, two of which are supported by our project. So I just wanted to finish off with some lessons learned from the Clean Currents Coalition today. Um, one thing that we've learned is it's really important to take a holistic approach, uh, as was mentioned earlier in the workshop, to these types of interventions. First of all, from the technology side of things, there's a lot of different options out there. Um, but it's really important that the approach be very tailored to the local context based on the volume of waste and the flow, um, the river hydrology and local culture. Next, it's really important to consider uh, permitting, which um, can be uh, in some cases a barrier to even initiating a project. And we found that it's really important to start early and build relationships with all of the relevant authorities and stakeholders, and also give authorities a sense of ownership and participation in the project so they wanna see it succeed as well. Next has been talked about already and will be talked about more is the importance of data collection. Um, it's important for evaluating the effectiveness of the devices and giving people the power to identify and influence and stop the sources of waste. It's important to be measuring waste before and after interventions. So you can demonstrate the impacts of the device itself, and you can use those data to influence policy. We at Benioff Ocean Initiative has also been working with the Clean Currents Coalition teams to develop artificial intelligence models that can automate and assist in the data collection process as well. Next, uh, also very important is outreach. Uh, it's important to be building relationships and involving members of the community to also give them a sense of ownership in the work that's being done. 
Um, it's important to be cultivating in those community members an understanding of how plastic waste affects everyone and that they all have a role to play in solving this problem. And last, I know has been talked about a little bit today, but is also really critical is proper disposal, recycling, and repurposing of waste to really prevent it from getting back in the river in the first place. Uh, a lot of places that we have been working don't have great waste collection or waste management services. So that's why a lot of it's ending up in the environment in the first place. Um, so this is definitely a really challenging area that requires certainly creativity and strong networking in order to solve. So that's all I have today. Thank you so much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you, Molly. And also thanks for jumping in second. I think we should have Gautier back. So Molly, if you want to go ahead and unshare your screen. Um, and then Gautier, I don't want to cut you off. So of course, we'll give you your full 10 minutes. Um, we might be short on Q&A. And so we'll try to, um, again, let you know when it's officially break and allow people to still ask questions if the speakers are willing to stay on because q and is super important. Gautier, can, let's see if we can hear you this time. And go ahead yeah, and share your screen. Yeah, this time. Sorry, I had some uh, some technical issues. So thanks for your patience. Um, does everything work this time? Um, we're okay. Yeah, if you take ten minutes, we'll have a few minutes for Q and A, and we'll cut into the break, and people can get up and use the washroom at will. Okay, perfect. So, well, um, so my name is Gautier Pierce, and I'm in charge of uh, water products and solutions in uh, in the Americas. Um, I would like to, uh, to thank everyone for joining us today uh, for this uh, amazing workshop. Um, I would also like to, uh, to thank uh, the University of Toronto and, uh, and Ocean Conservancy uh, for the opportunity to be a, a, a speaker during this workshop. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Chelsea and, uh, and everybody else. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, just a word about uh, water products and solutions. Um, so we are the exclusive uh, master distributor of Kuala Marine uh, science of, uh, of blue text uh, in the Americas. Uh, so basically my territory goes all the way from Chile to, uh, to Canada. Uh, so pretty small territory. Uh, so let me share my presentation with you. Um, can, can everybody see? Not yet. Yeah. Okay, perfect. No, no, not yet. Sorry, Gautier, we cannot oh, see. Oh, not yet? Yeah. Hold on, let me. Oh, yeah, I understand why. Okay, that is here. Is everything fine now? Yep, there you go. If you put it in presentation mode, you'll be good to go. All right, so. So basically, Poano Marine uh, manufactures a uh, few trash cropping technologies. Uh, the first one is the most famous one. Uh, we've been uh, selling it for about a year and a half uh, in the North, Amer North American market. Uh, it's a technology that uh, most of you are probably aware of. Uh, it's called Sibin, uh, and it's basically a steamer that captures cropping trash uh, as small as uh, two millimeters, such as uh, bottles, bags, uh, caps, cigarettes, uh, wrappers, uh, microplastics, etc., as well as uh, contaminated algae and hydrocarbons. Uh, we are going to launch uh, two new techs um, in June. Uh, the first one is called uh, Bbot. Uh, Bbot is the first 100% electric uh, beach cleaner robot. And it basically sifts uh, the sand uh, to uh, retrieve buried waste. Um, and then uh, around June as well, we'll be launching uh, a floating drone. Uh, and this floating drone will be the first solar powered uh, trash collector uh, drone. Uh, again, the goal is to intercept uh, floating trash and hydrocarbons uh, where skimmers can be installed. So on the right, you can see a bit a uh, picture of, uh, of those technologies. I try to, uh, to do a presentation not that's so much focused on our technologies. Um, you know, there's more a message that, uh, that I want to pass on uh, to everybody uh, today. 
the first one is that if we want to make a big impact, uh, we need to team up all together. Uh, this is very important. Uh, and what I mean by teaming up all together is that we need marina support, uh, public authorities, uh, universities, and NGOs uh, to work to work along with us. Um, so basically, I'm going to explain you the reasons why. Um, the first one is um, I'm going to disappoint maybe a lot of people today, uh, but the technology is not the real uh, solution to plastic pollution. So the real solution is basically education. Uh, we must educate and uh, change behaviors uh, to turn off the plastic tap. Uh, so if you look at the two uh, charts below, uh, you can see that uh, there's still a huge consumption of plastic uh, in Canada. Uh, the other thing as well is that most of this plastic is not recycled. Uh, Canada recycles only 24% uh, of the plastics. So this is what I call uh, the path to, uh, to success. Um, it's based on, uh, on a holistic approach. Uh, and what you mean by that is that the, the blue texts are not only used uh, to capture trash. Uh, they're also used by universities to uh, collect data and for research. And these data are used by NGOs for public outreach uh, to educate people and change uh, behaviors. The data, the data are critical uh, for fact-based public outreach. Uh, we need to be able to show something to people uh, and we need to show them facts. Um, and basically this public outreach is uh, essential uh, to educate people uh, and change behaviors. So I wanted to show you uh, a case study from uh, Post Toronto. Again, um, you know, my, my territory is uh, in the Americas. So I wanted to show something uh, that's local. Um, and something that I worked on. And uh, basically, Post Toronto Seeding uh, Pilot Program is uh, a perfect example of this uh, holistic approach. Um, so basically, seeding was not, uh, sorry, seeding is not uh, only used uh, to collect trash, uh, but it's also used as a research station. So uh, during summer and fall 2019, uh, Post Toronto piloted four seedings, uh, two at Outer Harbor Marina and two at, uh, at Pier 6. And these seedings uh, are used as research, research station uh, by the University of Toronto. So the University of Toronto uh, conducted a, a detailed study of the waste captured by these four bins uh, to identify and quantify the types of waste as well as to uh, track uh, their source. And uh, so these are some of their findings. Um, so the four seedings collected uh, 8,785 pieces uh, within a week. And uh, what they noticed is that uh, 84.5 uh, of what was collected were small debris, uh, whereas the seeding was initially designed uh, to capture bigger debris. Um, so the question was, was why? And uh, what they discovered uh, is that floating algae uh, mix up with uh, small debris. Uh, as a manufacturer, we didn't know that. And uh, basically now we ask our customers not to post uh, the algae captured by the seeding, uh, by the seedings back uh, in the water. Um, so let, let's now focus on the public outreach uh, to change mentalities. So basically Post Toronto installed uh, signs by the seedings uh, to educate people 
on the plastic pollution uh, of the Great Lakes. Uh, Post Toronto, uh, the Seedings Pilot Program caught uh, the media's attention. Um, so if you uh, Google it, uh, you can see like probably like hundreds of, uh, of press articles, uh, television came as well. Um, and when you get so much media coverage, uh, it really helps us raise awareness uh, on uh, the plastic pollution of the Great Lakes. Um, so some of you may have heard about uh, the Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup. Um, so the Great Lakes, Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup was uh, inspired by a post Toronto seeding pilot program and is really like the best example of this uh, holistic approach. Um, so again, by holistic approach, uh, I mean, to have the, uh, to basically do trash collection, plus data collection, plus research, plus public outreach. Um, so the, the Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup is uh, a coalition uh, that brings together uh, different actors. Um, so manufacturers of blue tags, uh, marinas, NGOs, universities, marina association, and public and private sponsors. Each of them has a different mission and they work together uh, to come up with a project that has the maximum impact uh, to make things change. Uh, so the Great Expert Cleanup is really the global be benchmark um, and it needs to be uh, duplicated in other parts of the world. So, here is uh, some pictures of uh, the CDs that were uh, installed thanks to the Great Plastic Cleanup. So maybe some of you can uh, can recognize those places. Um, some of them really have a high traffic, uh, like uh, uh, the Zoo of Toronto. And uh, basically, here is uh, so I'm, I'm I'm sharing with you a bit uh, my plans for. Uh, for the months to come, but that's really what I try to do now is to, uh, uh, to basically reproduce uh, this type of coalition uh, in other parts of North, North America. Uh, so we have formed similar coalitions in uh, British Columbia, uh, in Florida, uh, in the Mid Atlantic region. Um, and again, it's, uh, the idea really is to, uh, is to work all together so that you can have this holistic approach. Uh, and we can really make things change. Uh, and yeah, uh, uh, so basically that's a, that's a bit, you know, my presentation today. Um, you know, it was short, so I tried to stick to, uh, to the schedule, but uh, um, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, everybody for your attention today. Um, and I really hope that uh, my presentation uh, convinced you on the importance of uh, teaming up if we want to make this change. As a manufacturer, we won't be able to do it on our own. Um, so we need to have the marinas, we need to have the ports, we need to have the public authorities, we need to have the NGOs, we need to, ha to have everybody involved so that we can really like make things change. Um, so I really hope that uh, we'll be able to, uh, to achieve this goal with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gatier. Thank you so much. And thanks for, for a great talk. I'm really glad your tech ended up working. If you want to take your slide down. Um, so it is officially uh, 320. So technically it was uh, supposed to be break time. Um, but what we want to do is at least allow for Q&A. So for those of you that want to get up, use the washroom, take a, a health break, please do. And we're also going to kick everything back five minutes. So we're going to take the a full 10 minutes to allow for Q&A if Molly and Mike are okay. So Molly and Mike, please feel free to turn on your camera and unmute yourself. We'll do a 10 minutes of Q&A, but we are also officially on break. So anyone who wants to get up, go ahead. And we'll field Q&A. For those of you that want to ask out loud, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on that. Otherwise, we're going to go through questions in the chat. So I think, Cassie, if you can read us our first question, that would be awesome. For sure. So 
We have a question for Mike from Jill. She said, if you have a storm, if you have storm drains that have water come out of them when the lake levels are high, will what is trapped in the litter trap come back out onto the road with the water? Yeah, we've actually had this problem before with a, a pilot we did with uh, the city of Barrie and Lake Simcoe in Ontario. Um, we had uh, a couple of traps down, a uh, one trap down on the waterfront car park. And if the water does come back, it will float back out, obviously, because a lot of uh, the material is, is truly floatable. But some of the plastic and trash actually sinks as well. So that will typically stay in the bottom of the basket. Um, for this pilot, we actually moved the whole litter trap up to higher ground in the summer months where the water level came up. But if it was a permanent installation, it's pretty easy to remove the basket and during this period. Um, no trash will go down through the stormwater drain when the water level is above the stormwater drain. Um, so it's, it's, there's no flow at that point in time. So yeah, that's how we manage the situation essentially. Um, you know, is, is, is by removing the basket at a high, high tide or high water level in the summer. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, we're gonna ping pong back and forth when we have someone with a raised hand. So Dorsa, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question live, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Dorsa from Waterfront BIA. Um, this question is for Gautier um, specifically. Um, so we've been using um, sea bins at the at the waterfront in Toronto, and I was wondering if there's anyone that has ever done like something like googly eyes or something attractive looking or like something to kind of pinpoint the sea bins within the lake to kind of raise awareness and show people where they are. Um, if not, or if it's possible to do something like that to kind of raise awareness um, to, to the people about what we're doing. Yes, so um, I, I basically had uh, uh, an exchange of emails with uh, the Sibin project about that uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, I shared with them the list of all the locations where we have Sibins uh, in, uh, in North America. So it's definitely part of their plan uh, to show all the Sibins that have been uh, installed around here. Um, and I guess, yeah, the Sibins at uh, Post Toronto will be. Uh, uh, will appear on uh, the kind of like world map they have uh, on their website. Awesome. Thanks, okay, Gautier. Thank you. We've thought a lot about that too, Dorsa. Uh, Kathy, do you have another question in the chat? I do. And this one is for Molly from Kerry. Um, they ask, which of these projects have been the most successful and which have not and why? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, the project launched in early 2020, so I think you can imagine what was the biggest factor affecting um, success of projects this past year. Um, you know, like many of us, COVID really threw a wrench in some of our plans, um, and that made it really difficult to meet with authorities, to get permits, um, to meet with stakeholders, to get support for projects. So um, I would say within this past year, that has been a really big factor in the success of projects is, again, we're coming back to these human elements here of, of being really critical. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, there's been some challenges with the technologies, but that has not necessarily been the limiting factor in the success. Um, we've seen success of all of the different technologies um, across the different types of locations, something as small as a canal or a small stream up to larger rivers. Um, still being able to collect waste. So um, yeah, I would say the biggest factor for success or not has been um, some of those things that are outside of our control, like global pandemics um, and you know ability to, to meet with stakeholders and other authorities. Thanks for the question. A lot of sense. Cassie, you got another one? I do, and this one is for Mike from Brian. Are floatables lost through the overflow? Oh. Sorry, I just asked this one. It's um, um, my bad. Okay, they have been answered for Mike. Now I have one for Gautier. Um, they say, do you believe that something like seepins could work in an intracoastal waterway? Um, so yes, um, as a matter of fact, you know, I have discussions uh, with uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale, you know, here in Florida, that's, uh, that's where I live. Uh, and uh, yes, they are planning to uh, to install a network of seedlings 
uh, along the intracoastal, you know, so not only in marinas, uh, but uh, a bit everywhere. Uh, we, we basically make uh, two kind of seedlings. Uh, this one that's designed uh, to be attached uh, to floating docks, and this one that gives you a bit more flexibility uh, because this seedling comes with its own float. You know, so it can be basically installed more or less anywhere. Uh, it's tied onto a, a fixed structure with a, a wall. So when I say fixed structure, it can be uh, it can be a wall, uh, for example, um, and, uh, and 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 yes. Yeah, so it's uh, we are trying to expand a bit uh, outside of the marinas uh, and have seabins installed in other places and. Uh, Intracoastal waterways is definitely uh, one of my focuses. Well, Cassie, is that your last question in the chat? Um, I actually, there was one from Brian. It was the second part of his question, which is to Mike, which is where is the litter trap made? And he says, thanks for all the work that you do. Keep it up. Well, I was actually just reply, replying to the bypass question of Brian, actually. Um, yeah, so the bypass question first. Uh, We've done extensive testing about resuspension. It's no good capturing something and then to lose it when you get a big storm. Uh, and what we've found is that there's minimal resuspension because the bypass is located at the top of the basket and the water will take its easiest path. And it will, as if it's full, it comes and goes out the bypass before really resuspending the trap material. We can also remove the bypass and, and have no bypass. And we've been doing that with plastics factories and, and some sites because they have a zero discharge rule of compliance. If you do remove the bypass though, you need to have a pay close attention to the device. Um, if a storm's coming, you wanna make sure you empty it before because the last thing you wanna cause is flooding. Um, where it's made, because it's a, a globally applicable product, uh, we do make it in, in China. Um, but it's designed in New Zealand and distributed through a range of uh, locally um, locally sourced distributors. Wonderful. Okay. Cassie, do you have, maybe we have time for one more before we switch sessions? For sure. So um, someone asked, how much do Siebens cost? <laughs> Bing Gautier just answered it in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, he says 7,750 for the Sieben for floating docks and about 10,275 for mobile. And is that USD? It's in uh, it's in CAD. Uh, okay. I, I, I like this question a lot. I, I, I get in the, I get it very often. Uh, we the most important thing to understand here is uh, you know I mean those are all the pretty new concepts. You know, so it's not being mass produced. Uh, you see a, a product like Sibin is still made one Sibin at a time by hand in France, you know, and uh, we also have to use the, 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 the most, uh, you know, durable material uh, to make the Sibin. Uh, so really the idea for us was to, uh, to come up with a technology uh, that's as efficient and as durable as possible but at the, at the same time to make it as affordable as we could, uh, you know, so that a maximum number of places use it, you know. So I have like really mixed reactions about the price, you know, sometimes uh, people think it's gonna be, uh, you know, maybe a, a couple of hundred dollars. And sometimes I have people who think, you know, it might be uh, 20 or $30,000, you know. So I think, you know, with that kind of price range, uh, we, we could find the right uh, needle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. So I think since it's 329, we'll actually, we'll go ahead and switch sessions. I want to thank everyone for letting us kind of carry on. We really think the Q&A are the most important part um, of this type of a program. So if you have more questions and answers, please feel free to ask them in the chat and we'll try to get those answered for you. But right now let's thank our panel uh, virtual clapping. I know it's not the same as in a room, but thank you all so much. Um, and Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you for the next session. Amazing. So thank you. Um, and um, 
there may be a few of you who are just coming back from break, so welcome back. Um, we're going to uh, get started now. I'm going to bring on our next three speakers to share a little bit more about some local success local success stories. And when I say local, I mean here um, in Ontario, Canada. Um, so I have the privilege of bringing to speak here Mike David, project manager with um, Port Toronto. We have Neil Menezes with Eco Compass, the president, and we have uh, Mark Fisher, president and CEO for the Council of Great Lakes Region. And before I bring them on, just share very briefly our um, how our work um, works alongside them. And so a bit more about Mike, he brings uh, 15 years of experience designing and delivering projects both in Canada and internationally, and chairs the organization's employee-led sustainability committee. And that includes their work in the CBIN, with the CBINs in the Toronto Harbour, which is how we met. Um, they're one of our first groups that we reached back out to when we were talking about this idea of bringing the trash wheel to the city. And as you have heard a few times, we are now um, very happily working on this uh, CBIN work and taking some closer looks at what the data side can look like, which you'll learn a lot more about, um, particularly tomorrow. Um, so they're great to work with. And they've also been to a number of our community cleanups, actually pretty much all of them, <laughs> which has been great. Uh, Neil from EcoCompass has been working in the environmental and sustainability field for over 10 years and is currently leading the rollout of Operation Clean Sweep for the Chemistry Industry Association of Canada. And this is to achieve zero plastic resin loss into the environment. And that's how the capacity we got to know Neil. These images are showing some of the field work our research team led to investigate pellets in our waterways. And that helped inform this collaborative work, exploring the potential use of litter traps, which you've learned about at production facilities to mitigate this point source. And then lastly, we have Mark, who has extensive experience advising senior decision makers on a range of socioeconomic and environmental issues facing government, business, and nonprofit sector. He has joined the Canadian, the Council of Great Lakes Region in 2014 and is one of the founders of the Great Lakes Plastic Cleanup. And this is one of the largest initiatives using sea bins and litter traps to remove plastic and litter from marinas across the Great Lakes. And that's the capacity that we've been involved. Um, we've been looking at the waste characterization side of thing. Um, and here's a bit of a sneak peek, some spoilers for tomorrow about some of the work we've been doing. Um, but with that, what I'll do is I'm going to turn it over to Mike now um, for his presentation. And just a reminder, we'll do uh, about 10 minutes of presentations for each, and then we will have time uh, for Q&A following. Thank you, Susan. I'll just get my slides up. Can you see that? Yep, looks good. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Susan, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have joined in today. I'm really uh, excited to see how many people joined in to this event today. The, the Q&A has been really good. The, the discussion has been really great. I'm really excited to see this much uh, interest and activity in this area. And I, and I think it's probably safe to say this is gonna be the first of many of, of events like this. Uh, as Susan mentioned, my name is Mike David. I'm a project manager with Ports Toronto. I also lead our uh, sustainability committee which is employee, entirely employee uh, staff, and informs a lot of the sustainability tech decision-making at Ports Toronto. Uh, I've been working on our CBIN project and a few other initiatives for three years now. Uh, and I wanted to share a bit of a background and a couple of the success stories that we've seen or that we've experienced uh, with those programs over the last few years. Oops. So as you might have seen on, on Chris Sawicki's presentation earlier, Ports Toronto is charged with, uh, or Ports Toronto operates three business units, the Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport, the Port of Toronto and the Outer Harbour Marina. And the common thread that you'll see across all three of those, those business units is the Port of Toronto, which, sat, which sits kind of smack, smack dab in the middle of all three of them. Um, despite operating the harbour, we aren't actually technically responsible for water quality in the harbor. That falls to a number of our partner organizations, but we do have uh, a number of explicit obligations that we must maintain. Uh, specifically one that I wanted to address was that we are responsible for maintaining a harbor that is clear of dangerous debris and to ensure the safe navigation of vessels through this major waterway. That mandate was written in 1911. Uh, as Chris said, we're celebrating our 110th anniversary this year. But given, it's, given that it was written 110 years ago, you, you won't be surprised 
to know that that mandate doesn't include any mention of plastics, microplastics, floating trash. It was really, it was well suited to the, to the era that it was written in, but we're starting to look beyond uh, that mandate and what we can do to expand that. On screen, you can see a, uh, a photo of a driftwood boom that we operate, which is at the mouth of the Don River. This is a really low tech, uh, albeit effective solution for the issue of floating debris and something that we've managed effectively for well over a century now. But it's not, it's not gonna help us necessarily with the issue of floating trash, uh, which is a more modern uh, problem and, and therefore requires a bit more of a modern solution. We realized uh, a number of years ago that we needed to approach it, uh, that problem accordingly. So as, some, as part of our long-term sustainability strategy, we chose to, to re-examine our role as stewards of the Toronto waterfront to re-examine what our place was in, in making this harbor enjoyable for everybody who comes to use it for business, for pleasure, for whatever, uh, and ultimately how we as an organization could collectively begin to address the issue of plastics and microplastics in the area. So ultimately that process led to what we call our Seaman pilot program and phase one of that program, which you, you may have heard a few times about now. Uh, it kicked off in 2019 with the installation of a few sea bins uh, at our outer harbor marina uh, as, a, as a pilot, as I mentioned, we weren't testing that the sea bins could remove trash from the water that was well established and not something that we were really interesting in verifying, interested in verifying. What we wanted to do was confirm that they were fit for our purpose because as, as again, as you've heard, there is no one, uh, one size fits all solution and we wanted to make sure that this solution did, did fit for us and, and it did, it, the, the pilot was highly successful, we were thrilled with the work uh, with how they worked at the marina. And we ultimately rolled that out to phase two, which was the installation of a pair of sea bins uh, at Pier 6 in the Toronto downtown area. Uh, I think the best way to exemplify the success of our pilot, phase one, phase two, any part of it really, is uh, to look at the how quickly the sea bins were able to capture uh, media attention, the public's imagination, all of the above. They were incredibly effective conversation starters. And that's, that's one of the main goals we had with our pilot program was to get people interested in the issue and focused on the issue. Uh, I have two really quick anecdotes to probably best exemplify that, that effectiveness. Uh, first, I have a friend who lives out of town, probably need to speak to him more because he was obviously had no idea what we were doing here in Toronto. And he, he actually sent me a link to a recently published news article about our Seaman pilot program, having no idea that we were working on it and, and said to me, uh, you know, isn't this exciting? Look how cool this is. Uh, I wish, you know, we could see more things like this popping up. It's unfortunate again, that, that my friend didn't realize that I was working on these already, but I think it was interesting because he lives over an hour away and it, it was something that had popped up and kind of started to get into the public consciousness. Uh, secondly, and not long after that, I was at the Marina with our, our Marina manager uh, checking out the Seaman's one day and we saw a fella kind of ambling down the dock and he was, he looked a bit lost and we said, you know, can we help you find something? And he said, I'm, I'm here to see those floating trash cans that I saw on CBC. And he had, he had driven in over an hour from Kingston, about an hour up the road from Toronto, just to have a peek at them. And I think, I think those two stories are a really good way to exemplify how effective the sea bins have been at um, igniting discussion and, and getting people interested in the issue. Um, again, with the first stage of the Seabin pilot deemed a success, we, we, we rolled that out to stage two at Pier 6. Um, this was distinct from our marina in that it was much more exposed to, to the wind and to the wave action uh, of Lake Ontario. It's, it's, it's not the North Atlantic, but it's, it's certainly less sheltered than, than our marina. And it is truly an urban environment. Our Seabins at the marina were very sheltered. They were under our watchful eye 24-7. Uh, at Pier 6, we were kind of putting them up into the wild, so to speak, and we were very interested to see how they would work uh, in that environment. Uh, and the other, the other goal we had with Phase 2 was to get, these, to get these in front of people. We had seen that the media and the public was quite interested with uh, the sea bins, but they were sort of tucked away at our marina, and they were kind of hard to see, uh, unless you were very, very keen to come look at them. So by putting a few sea bins on the waterfront, we thought we'd get a lot more kind of eyes on them and a lot more public attention. Uh, and to that effect, it was phenomenally successful. We were very happy with the attention we were able to get and, and with kind of the collective conversation that it continued to push forward. 
Uh, it also gave us an opportunity to expand the research we were doing with the U of T. And I, I consider our partnership with the University of Toronto uh, as probably the most significant success of our, of our season pilot program. Uh, as you've heard, uh, to quantify the problem and to inform policy, ultimately, the trash team researchers collect and analyze uh, anthropogenic debris, including plastic, microplastics, et cetera, and th which are captured in these sea bins. Uh, earlier, you heard Cassandra Sherlock briefly mention uh, the protocols that they're developing for categorizing and, and characterizing the waste that the sea bins catch and to extrapolate that into the models that are used uh, and have been mentioned today. Those models are something that we as an organization wouldn't have a clue on where to start. It's not our role. It's not what we're here to do, but we're very happy to be able to partner with a, an organization like the trash team or a team like the trash team so that we can come, uh, collaboratively and effectively de develop these things so that they can be used kind of locally and globally to, to address this problem. And if you jump forward to October of last year, the Canadian federal government announced a ban on certain single use plastics, which is a perfect example of the sort of policy change that you'll tend to see follow on from the public taking a broader interest in a problem like this. Uh, and we're not, phase two uh, wrapped up last year, phase three upcoming, we're very happy to say, of course, that we're, we're not done yet. We have the intention of rolling this out considerably further in the years to come. Um, in 2021, we hope to have as many as 12 sea bins installed in the Toronto Harbour. Uh, and we're also in discussions actively with a number of other organizations who manufacture or design similar products uh, so that we can trial uh, and test similar products in the Toronto Harbour. Again, because it's not a one size fits all and we want, to, we want to try as many things as we can to see how we can start addressing the problem. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think the biggest success for our program has been sharing our story. We were never here, we're never intending to solve the trash problem alone, it's just not possible. Uh, and, and we're a local organization with a local mandate. But it is fantastic to see the interest that it has sparked, uh, and we were happy to take credit for the very small part we've played in, in that, and to see people at a session like today, it's, it's, it's fantastic, and we hope to build off this momentum. Uh, and I, in summary, I think it's safe to say that solving the plastic problem isn't going to be uh, an overnight solution. I think as events like this become more common, as conversations like this become more common, we're going to eventually hit uh, a tipping point where we have the solutions, we have the data, we have basically everything in hand that we need to start solving the problem. And, and at that point, uh, optimistically, I would say it's just a matter of time and it's just a matter of doing the work uh, and something that we look forward to doing in the, the years to come. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we'll um, bring uh, Neil on. So I invite Neil, you can um, share your screen. So if you can, there you go. Perfect. Um, so we'll turn it over to Neil and then we will um, hear from Mark before our Q&A. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Neil, whenever you're ready. Can you uh, see my screen? Uh, I can see you. I don't see a presentation just quite yet. Okay. Give me one second. How about now? Yep, looks great. Um, just perfect. Well, uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about some of the action industry has taken to um, uh, addressing the plastic resin loss. So what I'm gonna do is kind of walk you through one of the pilot projects that we worked with, um, with industry, with the Ministry of Environment, the U of T and uh, EnviroPod on deploying litter traps to address um, plastic resin loss. Just in terms of uh, background on EcoCompass and myself, I'm an environmental consultant that's been working in this field for over 10 years. Um, I support a wide range of different organizations um, to implement and develop uh, waste diversion programs. And the focus is typically on program operations, some data analytics, and some strategic partnerships um, as various groups work towards a common goal or common interest. So over the years, I worked with municipalities like Keele, York, Niagara region, um, and as well as on the industry side, like the Canadian Plastic Industry Association, Canadian Beverage Association, and Chemistry Industry Association of Canada. And there are a lot of industry members and associations that obviously want to do their part in addressing um, the various environmental issues, especially around plastic loss. 
And I think this is a, just a great opportunity to show how the different stakeholders can work together to address a common goal or a common issue. So one of the programs that the Canadian Plastic Industry Association and the Alberta Plastic Recycling Association was working on was to launch Operation Clean Sweep. Operation Clean Sweep was actually a program that was designed in the US as a volunteer program for members to prevent, uh, for, for members to work towards a zero pellet loss uh, into the environment. And the Canadian Plastic Industry Association as well as APRA were responsible for promoting the program to its members here in Canada. Through that relationship, the University of Toronto and the Ministry of Environment um, contacted the CPIA to roll this program, uh, what was cleverly called Operation Sweep the Creek, which was effectively looking at the OCS program, but more in a localized area within the Mimico Creek area. One of the key things that we wanted to do uh, through this program was to identify the, the various plastic resin manufacturers uh, in that area that were, could be potentially contributing to the pellet loss that was being found within the uh, environment and within the creek. So, I, you know, Chelsea kind of mentioned earlier some of the research, there's clearly some evidence that, you know, during wet periods that there was an increase in plastic pellets or pre-production pellets that were being found within Mimico Creek. And our role through this pilot project was to work with the different uh, plastic manufacturers to identify what their processes were for managing and containing pellets on their site. We were fortunate that one of the members uh, invited us to their facility and it allowed us to present some of the key findings from the UFT research, but then also gave us an opportunity to look at, look, at, look at their operations in person to identify what some of those initiatives were and how could we share some of those best practices and knowledges to um, other stakeholders. So just to kind of highlight some of the existing initiatives, um, I won't go through all of them, but a lot of it was just common house cleaning practices. So cleaning up spills when they occurred, trying to keep the area as tidy as possible. Two of the big things that they mentioned that they found critical were switching from uh, blowers to push out the pellets to using vacuum system to actually collect the pellets. And if any, if any of you have experience dealing with these pellets, they're really light. And any gust of air or wind can, can um, force them to spread over vast distances. So through these minor changes, and it was pretty evident as we walked through the facility, that a lot of the pellets were, um, it, they were minimal. In addition to their cleaning practices, they also implemented these two uh, catchment systems beyond um, below connection points. So one was where they connect to their silos where they store uh, the pellets. And the another one was when they were offloading the pellets from rail cars. And you can see underneath the silo system, there weren't a lot of pellets visible, but close to the rail car system, that small, you know, in um, fairly cheap catch bin was effective at diverting um, a relatively large amount of pellets from entering into the environment. However, it was still evident, even though that they, even though they implemented those practices, it was still evident that they were losing some pellets in this process. This facility received pellets both through rail cars as well as trucks. And what we noticed is the majority of pellets that were that were visible were around the uh, rail tracks as opposed to the truck loading area. In addition to that, we noticed that they had small mesh screens on only two of the storm drains but the remaining three at their site did not have any screens or covers. This obviously led us to an opportunity, and I think you can see where we're going with this in terms of how the litter trap uh, could be used to help prevent some of the plastic resin from entering into the environment. But once we identified the issue, at that time, we were aware of the litter trap, but we understood it to be used mostly for catching large litter pieces and not the pellets that we were that were less than five mill millimeters and how the litter trap could be used to it. In discussion with the Envirop Enviropod folks, um, Michael and Joe and Greg, we learned that they also provided a pellet liner. 
this was something that would go on top of the existing uh, litter trap and would catch anything greater than one millimeter, which was perfect because at the time the pellets were only three millimeters in size. So what, through this pilot, we wanted to test the durability of these litter traps, um, how easy it was to maintain them, and also to um, identify the quantity of pellets diverted. And Michael mentioned this early in his presentation, and I'm glad he didn't steal too much of my thunder, but the goal was because we recognize the plastic resin floats, we were afraid that if we allowed the bypass or we uh, bypass to be open when we install the lead traps, that if there was a surge of water, the, the pellets would just flow out of the bypass uh, system. So what we did is we asked them to block them and cover them off. And this was another way of stress Stress, stress testing the litter traps. We wanted to make sure that if there were surges in water, it wouldn't cause any flooding. Primarily because this was an outdoor facility that was away from residential area, flooding wasn't a huge concern, but we still wanted to see um, to what degree uh, flooding could occur. After all of these discussions, uh, litter trap was able to provide us two um, litter traps with the pellet liner as part of the pilot project, and they were installed by EnviroPod in December 2019. As part of the pilot, when we installed them in December, we recognized that once the Canadian winter has hit, there wasn't going to be a lot of servicing or data we could collect for until the snow melted. But by the time the snow melted, we were in March, April, and we got hit with COVID. So a lot of the facilities were really cautious about uh, allowing us on site. And they also had to make changes in their operations to ensure that staff were safe before they were able to uh, fully roll out the litter traps into, uh, into the remaining storm drains on site. However, by June 2020, uh, we were able to um, get back on site and EnviroPod was able to install three more litter traps to ensure that all five storm drains on site um, had a litter trap installed. The first litter trap, which was initially installed in December 2019, was at the rail tracks where there was clearly evidence of pellet spills. And then the remain, there was a second one closest to the main entrance point with the three storm drain in between um, being installed in June. And the idea was to see where we were going to be catching most of the pellets and what was the amount of pellets that we would be diverting. So over the, between um, June 2020 and December 2020, we tried to get back on site to empty these storm, to empty these litter traps, to measure and quantify the different types of contaminants found within them. So we had three collection points and you know, we, we were aiming to get them collected on a monthly basis, but due to unforeseen circumstances, we were only able to collect them on three different occasions. And what I've done is I've listed those three different days that the materials were collected and the information that was provided back to us by the EnviroPod team in terms of what they saw within the litter trap. And also they provided us observations in terms of, you know, what was the level of uh, depth material found within the litter traps. What were the different types of contaminants? And you can see there's a coke can found within the litter traps. But in there, you can also see there are small white flecks of the pellets found within uh, in the litter trap. So all of this is we had a pretty good sense from those visible observations that it was working. But now the next step was trying to figure out how much, how effective are they, and what was the amount of pellets that were being diverted by installing these litter traps. So working with the University of Toronto, we were able to use the sampling methodology that they developed for the CBIN project to actually quantify and sort the each, uh, each uh, litter trap where we have pulled the materials over those three collection points. And the university team was able to separate into fragments, pellets, and foam. And so you can see they took the material from a pile that consists of pellets, sediment, other dirt and grime, 
and sorted it out into just the plastic pieces and elements that we were looking for and we really wanted to quantify. And I, I have to thank Nicholas and Cassie who went through the process. I think it was in late fall. So they had to do it outdoors with the COVID restrictions um, to sort these materials and quantify it to determine the amount of plastic items lost in this process. Through that process, because we had three elements, we we took the daily average and we scaled it up to estimate the annual loss of pellets that were occurring in this facility, as well as the weight lost. So in terms of the total pellets loss, we estimate around 60,000 plastic pieces are now going to be diverted through the installation of the five layer traps across the site. Based on the weight of each uh, pellet, we estimate that's around 1.2 kilograms of materials that will be diverted annually. And this is always a tough discussion to have with industry as well as different stakeholders because the facility, in terms of the pellets they receive, they receive about two rail cars per week, uh, which can be upwards of you know, 2,000 tons of material on a weekly basis. So when trying to present the information of 1.2 kilograms in relation to the total amount of plastics that they manage, it may seem insignificant. But what we're trying to understand is there's still an opportunity to improve. And the litter traps are inexpensive enough that you know, that's still 60,000 pieces that can be diverted through a fairly low maintenance piece of equipment. And when you multiply that across the numerous number of facilities across Canada, in addition to the fact that this facility was about mid-size and had implemented some significant um, initiatives to avoid plastic pot spills, we know other facilities have um, potential areas of improvement. So we want to focus on what are those key takeaways that we can share with industry and make sure uh, we can communicate that to all industry players to be responsible through in the production and managing of plastic pellets. One thing that was a little bit surprising um, and worked against what I had intuitively thought was while the abundance of pellets was, while well, the most abundant vis or pellets that were visible uh, was around the rail tracks. It was actually one of the storm drains closest to the truck loading site that had the most amount of plastic pellets found. And we'll, through discussion with the, with the university as well as Enviropaw, what we recognize is um, there are a couple of different factors that affect where the pellet, plastic pellets can be seen versus where they can be found in the storm drains. And one of the key things we realize is based on the gradient of the facility in terms of how the water runs off the facility, as well as the areas that are paved. The rail tracks are paved to a certain degree, but there are still two, two large rail tracks that prevent the materials going from where they're seen to actually flowing into the storm drain. In terms of where the truck loading is, the entire area is paved and slopes directly into the storm drain. So it's important to realize, even though the pellets may not be visible uh, on site, it's important to make sure all of these storm drains or as many of the storm drains are covered with, the, uh, with some sort of screen or litter trap to make sure that any runoff is caught through uh, COP ID systems. So with that in mind, I just want to quickly talk about what's next. So the Chemistry Industry Association merged with CPIA and is now leading the relaunch of Operation Clean Sweep in Canada. I'm supporting them in that process and we expect that program to be launched in the spring of 2021. So in the coming months, we will see more information or you'll see more, potentially more information in terms of the different step industry is taking to address these, uh, these problems. As part of the program, we, are, we work with the University of Toronto, the Western University Pollution Probe, and also various different companies that are responsible for managing the plastic pellets to make sure that the program we roll out is gonna be effective and understand and easy to implement. Because one of the key things we recognize through this process is it's a continuous improvement process. We don't get to zero plastic pellet loss overnight. And with developments and innovations that occur, we know operations will always need to change and therefore the measures taken to, to keep to meet those changes will also need to be updated over time. The ultimate goal 
for the CIAC is to have all of your plastic division members to be implementing LCS by the end of 2022. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk about the industry experience and I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, that was lovely to hear all the um, nitty gritty of what's been happening with your work. I uh, will bring Mark up now. So Mark, I invite you to um, turn your video and audio on and you can share your screen and begin. Uh, and then we will leave some time for q and I'm sure there'll be lots of great questions. That's great. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, everything's working great. Oh. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, the introduction and Chelsea, the opportunity to uh, present uh, today. Um, it's uh, It's been months in the making, but we're really looking forward to sort of giving an update on the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup, which has involved uh, a lot of people who are participating in today's uh, workshop. Um, so just a little bit about the Great Lakes region to start. Uh, as many on the call uh, on the workshop will know, it's it's a binational region of Ontario and Quebec. Uh, when you look at the region uh, more broadly, it's home to roughly 107 million people. And in fact, if it was the country, it'd be the 12th largest country uh, in the world by population. Uh, it's a region that generates roughly six trillion in economic output every year. Again, if it was a country, um, this region would uh, equal the third largest economy in the world behind the United States and China. Um, but it's also home to the Great Lakes, the five Great Lakes, uh, which represents roughly 21% of the world's surface freshwater, 84% of North America's surface freshwater. And so the Council of the Great Lakes Region uh, serves as a forum to bring together industry, government, academia, the broader nonprofit sector to really think more strategically about how we position this region for long term economic success. But also, how do we work together across borders and sectors uh, to protect the Great Lakes and the environment for future generations? And as we think about the environment, as we think about the Great Lakes and plastic, which has been touched on a lot today, um, you know, we came at this issue uh, over the last number of years, working with our research partners um, and really trying to understand uh, the plastic waste challenge in the region at the same time as we were learning uh, a lot about what was happening in our oceans. And, I think the results of that research um, and those conversations are, are quite concerning. It's alarming. Um, you know, when you look at the waste that we, we generate in the region, 80% of it still goes to landfills, uh, including valuable plastics. Um, and as we've seen through Chelsea's research and the research of others, including Rochester Institute of Technology, you know, models suggest that upwards of 20 million pounds of plastics could be entering the Great Lakes every year uh, through a variety of different sources and pathways. Um, with in fact microplastics reaching levels um, that in some cases are on par with what we find in the ocean's carbon patches, um, which is obviously quite concerning. And we also see that, you know, 80% of the material that are washing up on the Great Lakes shoreline is, is plastic um, and other debris and litter. Um, you know, plastic waste is lost to the environment in part because of limited material recycling and reuse opportunities. Um, and we also know through different studies, particularly by the US EPA uh, and others, that uh, the cost of combating and curtailing plastic pollution, whether through beach cleanups and waterway cleanups, uh, anti-litter campaigns, new stormwater capture devices, and advanced recycling could cost easily upwards of 400 million annually. Um, so we know that this is a, is a significant problem uh, now facing the Great Lakes region. So the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup, um, it's an initiative of the Council of the Great Lakes Region, but also Pollution Probe, which is Canada's uh, oldest environmental charity. Um, it's an initiative that was launched in 2020 with funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada, Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation of Parks, and Nova Chemicals, one of our first corporate partners. Um, this initiative, as, as some have already mentioned, is currently the largest deployment. We think it's still the largest deployment of sea bins and litter trap technologies in the world. Uh, and focuses on removing plastics from the environment, but also studying plastic pollutions in the Great Lakes, um, but also and, and also educating coastal communities about plastic litter pre prevention. Um, there are many, many key partners involved, including Boating Ontario, the University of Toronto Trash Team, Georgian Bay Forever, 
Poralu Marine, uh, Water Products and Solutions, Enviropod, Ports Toronto. Again, many of the uh, of the speakers and participants in today's uh, session. So marine collaboration is key um, in plastics cleanup. Right now, we have about 21 marinas from Lake Ontario to Lake Superior who have committed to join and participate uh, in the initiative over, initiative over an initial five-year period. Um, and in 2020, uh, we were able to place 21 sea bins um, and 11 litter traps. Another five marinas with sea bin technology already purchased and installed also joined the effort in the first year, albeit later in the season. The level of participation in the initiative certainly reinforces the value of the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup's mission, um, but more importantly, the importance of working together to end plastic waste and plastic pollution in, in the Great Lakes region. The involvement of marinas is also a clear demonstration of their high level of environmental uh, uh, commitment and protection and the, uh, what they're striving for in Ontario um, as part of their Boating Ontario's Clean Marine Program, which has been a major driver of change and sustainability. So what did we find in the first year? Um, the sea bin and litter traps that we've heard um, collect a lot of different types of, and sizes of plastic material. And uh, what we found throughout the 2020 season, which admittedly was, was um, a shortened season because of the pandemic, um, we found uh, obviously fragments of small uh, plastic film, which represented about 22% of what we found, uh, foam pieces, uh, hard fragments, uh, small pellets, and then obviously uh, larger um, uh, plastics and, uh, you know, such as cans and food wrappers and cigarette butts as well. Um, so very similar to what we've heard in, in other presentations. See the top three plastic items collected from the sea bins in Lake Superior and Lake Ontario and Lake Erie uh, were as follows. So in Lake Superior, we saw more uh, small plastic fragments and uh, film and foam. Lake Huron, again, film and foam, but we also found larger cans. And that just might be because it's, um, you know, Lake Huron, we're starting to get to more densely populated areas. And then Lake Ontario, uh, we found foam, um, and, uh, but also uh, small fragments. And, uh, and pellets. And I think that that's an indication of, of obviously Lake Ontario being much closer to some of the larger industries that are uh, that exist in, in the region. And so very briefly, you know, in terms of what we learned, um, you know, clearly launching the, the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup in the midst of a global pandemic, you know, presented some unique challenges, um, but we also learned a lot about the program. Um, first and foremost, with the cleanup, um, you know, sea bins and litter trap devices, uh, they have the ability to capture a lot of different debris, um, but they need to be emptied and maintained per protocols. And that's something that we will continue to, to work on uh, going into the next boating season with our marina partners. In terms of analysis, um, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, with the daily monitoring that's required with the uh, waste characterizations that's required four to five times a year, you know, having a dedicated network of local volunteers is, is critical, um, but also the ease of reporting. You know, we were very fortunate to be able to leverage the, uh, the data uh, app that was produced by the University of Toronto uh, for that daily monitoring, uh, but also looking at how do we ensure that there's ease of reporting for the waste characterization uh, going forward. And then finally, with public education, um, we think reconnecting communities to the water is the easiest way to address litter problems. And, um, you know, but marinas require the materials, whether it's signage or social media or brochures to really help tell the story. So that's something that we've also been working on over the wintertime is a, a program in a box that really gives the, the marinas all the tools that they will need to, to, to run a successful program locally and to be able to connect their programs into a much larger program across the, uh, the Great Lakes region. So what do we see as some of the next steps going into the, uh, the second year of this program? So the first year of, of the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup, while difficult, um, certainly demonstrated the value and the need for the initiative. Um, you know, looking ahead, you know, it goes without saying, you know, to expand the program, we need to secure more funding from different sources. Um, you know, we were very fortunate, again, to have government funding, um, but, you know, we also need to look at different sources, including foundations and, and business. Um, that will allow us to really identify more marinas, um, not only in Ontario, but uh, hopefully across the eight Great Lakes states and truly making this a, a binational uh, Great Lakes plastics cleanup. 
engaging local groups who can uh, adopt a C-bin or a litter trap or other device and uh, being able to assist with the waste characterization. Um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to rely on, on Chelsea and her lab to do a lot of the waste characterization, uh, Western, Lambton College, Georgian Bay Forever. But as the network of devices gets larger, um, you know, we're going to have to find local groups who can really step up and step in and, and help with some of that waste characterization and even potentially with the daily monitoring as we know that uh, marinas are super busy getting boats in the water uh, and making sure that their uh, boating community is, um, you know, enjoying their summer. And so uh, we want to make sure that their, their participation is as is, is e easy and as seamless as, as possible. So finding those local participants, vol volunteers, I think will be critical going forward. And then lastly, to amplify engagement and, uh, of awareness is, um, you know, being able to continue to, to provide and design signage and brochure templates, event tools, and social media support, again, just to make it really, really easy for marinas to, to connect into the network and participate in the network and to really help tell their story about, um, you know, how they're thinking about plastics in their own backyard, how they're removing plastics, and how they're educating coastal communities about the importance of recycling and and um, and um, limiting uh, litter um, that is finding its way into the environment. Um, so obviously, we're very excited to be to be uh, you know to have the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup finally up and running, to see it expanding, to seeing so much interest. Um, you know, much like the program um, uh, at Ports Toronto. Um, you know, we're learning a lot. Um, it's still early days, and um, again, we wouldn't be able to do this without a lot of different partners. You know, including the University of Toronto, who produced a lot of the protocols, um, the technology, um, and all to see our, our funding partners. So, again, really excited about the initiative and and looking to uh, looking forward to seeing what's going to happen in uh, in future years. So, uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll close and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we have um, almost exactly ten minutes to do questions before we wrap up for the day. So. Um, Mike and Neil and um, uh, Mark here, thanks so much for sharing. If you all want to put your videos back on, the three of you will go between based on the questions that we have. Um, so just as a reminder, as, as um, the, the other two are getting their videos ready, uh, you can type questions in the chat and you can also use the raise hand feature and we'll go uh, back and forth um, based on that. So I don't see any raised hand questions. Um, so I'll just check with our team. I know they're having questions in the chat. So we'll um, go to, I think Chelsea is looking at the chat now to pull out a few questions. Sure. So the first question I see, I mean, I guess in general, any of you could answer this question um, because it applies to both traps and sea bins, although it's specifically about the sea bins and it's who pays for them, the marina or the funding partner. So I guess in all three of your situations, it might be useful to know who, who pays for your bins. I'd be happy to start. Um, I think in our case, in the first year, we were able to really leverage funding from government to buy the sea bins. Um, but this is ultimately a multi-year effort. And um, at least through the Great Lakes Plastics cleanup, um, you know, we've worked out a partnership with marinas where they'll start contributing financially in years three, four, and five as part of a buyback program. And ultimately, at the end of year five, they, they will um, um, uh, receive ownership of, of the device. And... Um, and basically get the device at uh, at half price. Um, the the um, uh, the funding support that they also provide will go to support the the science and and all the other sort of administrative aspects of the of the program at the same time. Okay, um, I think we can go to more chat questions, uh, Chelsea. I'll just um, as we pull out the next question. If you do want to ask out loud, you're welcome to. But it does seem like we have a good number of chat questions to get to as well. Sure. Okay. And I think, so the next question is, um, actually, this one is specifically for Mike, but maybe also applies to Neil. And that is, is there a sort of trade group, uh, well, in particular for this one for Mike, for ports and harbors, and this could also be uh, for industries, um, that could be a place for conversations about possibilities uh, to grow these types of projects. So I guess we'll start with Mike, if you want to answer this question. Are there sorts of trade groups where these conversations could be had and lessons learned shared? Uh, there is absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're a member of a number of those groups. Uh, and we're, as Mark mentioned, we work with the Council for the Great Lakes region as, as obviously a port authority on the Great Lakes. 
is also the Association of Canadian Port Authorities. Uh, there's a number of different organizations that, that we as a port authority uh, work with, but we also work with some of our local organizations like the Toronto Region, Region uh, Conservation Area, the City of Toronto Parks Department, people like that. Um, and we, we've seen even in the last few years that there's been a lot of progress in those partner organizations because, because everybody's starting to get on board and kind of get the message. And um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. And Neil, did you want to answer for in sure. relation to what you're doing? Yeah, I think from the industry perspective, the CIAC is probably the best group to kind of talk to you about this, especially now as we're trying to relaunch the uh, OCS program. So um, if there are possibilities, we're definitely open to it. And uh, my contact information is uh, is on in the presentation and I'll share it with the uh, UFT team to send it out if, if need be. Um, but we are definitely looking for possibilities. Um, you know, the industry is eager to, the industry does what it does well is make plastic. So, you know, the other people who may be seeing some of the negative impacts or potential negative impacts, they're always open to work and collaborate. So you can either contact me directly or the uh, Chemistry Industry Association Canada and we're open for any, any sort of possibilities to kind of work towards that zero plastic uh, resin loss goal. Okay, we have time for a few more chat questions. Chelsea, if you want to pull out another one. Okay, awesome. And I see a lot of questions coming in actually that we'll go into much greater detail on tomorrow. So these questions are great uh, in terms of, of giving us a warm up. So this question could be for Mike uh, or Mark and it's what kind of quantities in terms of pounds of plastic did the Siebens collect? And what is the expectation in terms of future poundage collected? Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly add because I think Mike has more to say because he's had sort of more more years of operation under his belt. But I think um, when we look at the limited uh, amount of time we had during the pandemic um, with the waste characterizations, you know, we did see um, an important amount uh, being collected. Um, but I think we had a limited season to work with, to be fair. Um, so I think to get a better representation of what can be collected, you know, Mike might be the best person to respond to that because he's had more uh, more experience and more years uh, to work with. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. I think an important point is it's never been zero. We've never had a bin in the water for 24 hours and found nothing in it. Uh, at the low, at the lowest points, when the wind and the waves are kind of working against the sea bins, it still works out to being a, a decent amount, uh, which might be something like a pound. Uh, weight can be misleading though because an empty pop bottle or the, the plastic pellets we've seen, they're, they're nearly weightless. Uh, it's the volume or the quantity of these things that is more telling. Um, and, and because mass can be skewed, we often collect floating, floating uh, organic debris, which can heavily skew the mass of, the, of what we catch in the sea bins, but again, doesn't tell the whole story. So it, it varies based on the seasons, based on the wind, but it's, it's always something. Uh, and to answer the question about uh, Kind of future projections or how much you can collect it's really just a question of scalability we kind of nominally assume we can collect one to two kilos a day of, of plastic um, and then it's a question of how many bins do you have how many days are they in the water in, in our climate where they come out during the winter because of ice um, and just multiply that by, by as far as you want to keep them in the water great okay so still no um raised hand questions. So we can continue in the chat. Um, I'm not sure how many questions there are, Chelsea, but we I think we probably have time for at least two. Okay, there's a couple more. Yeah. Um, there's one in here particularly about um, monitoring and who monitorings and if, monitors. And if we have time for that, I'll come back to it, but we're gonna go in great detail about that tomorrow. So I kind of wanna ask this one, which even I'm interested in. This question's for anyone. Has anyone experienced vandalism of their technology? Um, and if so, is there a way to secure it? How do you deal with that issue? Yeah, I think in our case across the Great Lakes, we haven't seen anything yet. Um, you know, knock on wood, cross our fingers. Um, but you know, I think we'll have to address that as it comes up. But it hasn't been an issue so far. Anyone else want to take an answer of that one as well, or no, or also no issue? Uh, I would mirror the same thing. We've had no issue, uh, somewhat to our surprise, frankly, especially with the CVMs that we installed in the Toronto downtown area, but we've had no direct uh, vandalism. The, the, the maintenance issues we've experienced have generally been 
very minor things and they've been generated by extremely windy or high wave action days. Yeah, and from the industry perspective, most of this is private property. So limited access for uh, uh, the public to potentially vandalize any of the equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the final question uh, is about where is the plastic coming from? So this question is, so Neil, this question is probably not for you because I think we know the answer. Um, but for the two people working in marinas, Mike and Mark, are is are the marinas themselves a significant source of plastics, or are they primarily a sink? And where is where this material? I guess if you have any thoughts of where it might be coming from. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll start again. Um, you know, I think it, it, it the answer is it depends. Um, you know, we've seen sites that are obviously close to industry where we'll see more industrial like plastic show up, uh, pellets and and the like. Um, you know, and obviously if there are marinas or yacht clubs, uh, cause both can participate that have picnic areas, obviously that can be a contributor in terms of, uh, windblown litter, um, you know, things that are just, um, naturally, you know, finding its way into the environment because there, there's just a lot more activity. And then obviously because of the great lakes, um, you know, there is the transportability of, of some of these plastics, particularly the larger plastics and that research that was done by the Rochester Institute of Technology, in fact, shows that material that is deposited in Toronto can actually find its way over to, to, to Rochester um, just through the circulation of the lake. So we, we know that there are some, some amount, some volume that is probably being transported a, a certain distance, but most of it is, is localized. Mike, do you wanna answer this one too? Yeah, I think it, it really depends where you put your bin. Generally, I would say most of it comes from elsewhere. And for us, the marina is acting as a sink. Uh, our marina happens to be at the end of a kind of a, an, an inlet. And, and the wave and the wind forces tend to drive plastic into our marina. And once it's there, uh, it, it doesn't have a great deal of places to go. But that's not to say that we don't see litter that's directly and clearly a result of marina activities or people on shore having picnics, like Mark said. Uh, a lot of things involved in hauling in boats and hauling out boats, floats, you know, the marine styrofoam and things like that uh, is difficult to control on shore. And we do end up picking up a little bit of that in this season as well, especially in the spring and fall when those marine act, when the boats are sort of coming in and out of the water. Uh, I, if I had to guess, it's probably 80% non-local and 20% local, but that's just off the top of my head. Thank you so much for your answers. We're gonna to transition to our wrap up, but I wanted to thank the three of you for this session. It was great to hear. Um, and not a question, but I'll just note to Neil, there is a recent comment if you haven't seen it yet about some interesting um, pellet work happening on the West Coast. Great, okay. So let me just get everything set up to wrap up for the day. I hope that everyone's starting to feel inspired, um, you know, learn some things we already know and learn some things that are new. And so as we come to the end of our first day, we're just gonna wrap up and let you know a little bit more about what our plans are for tomorrow. Um, so just wanna thank everyone so much for your attention today and all of your engaged conversations and Q and A periods that we had. And um, so we'll go over today, uh, tomorrow, and then we have another short closing activity Mentimeter question. So first of all, a thank you to all of our speakers. So some of tomorrow's speakers are also in this image. Uh, but today we heard from Chelsea Rockman, we heard from Chris Sawicki and Allison Schutz all about our collective vision. We then heard from John Kellett about the story behind Mr. Trash Wheel. Uh, we were joined as well by Mike Hanna, Gautier Piers and Molly Morris with details about some other incredible trash trapping devices. And just now we heard from Mike David, Neil Menezes and Mark Fisher with a local look at some of the successful applications um, right here in uh, Canada. So just to quickly recap the day again, we spent some of our time familiarizing ourselves with the global problem and encouraging the solution of trash trapping technology. And the presentation shared our vision and some examples of these traps in action. So for those who are able to join us tomorrow, we hope that's all of you. Um, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're gonna take a deeper dive on the topic. A lot of questions we didn't get to today are actually being covered tomorrow, which is great. Um, so we're gonna have some hands-on discussions and these are gonna be about some of the steps to get these projects off the ground or if you have a project to continue to grow that project. And that's um, from our perspective, some of the things we've learned. We'll then actually break into some hands-on discussions about these key areas uh, that 
were touched on today, some ownership and operation considerations, the importance of data and what goes into that, as well as the role of outreach and communications and some more insight into googly eyes. Uh, then we'll wrap up the day with the digest to put it all together, as well as, of course, sharing more specific information about this network we're building and how all of us today can stay connected once our workshop is over. So, um, in very like quick form, that's what we covered today and giving you a bit of a highlight of what's coming up for tomorrow. Um, so similar to what we already did this morning, same instructions. I'm going to just open the chat and put the link right here if you want to go there directly. And you can also enter the code. So I'm going to switch to the screen. We're just curious to know what types of things you're excited to learn about tomorrow. So I'm going to switch over to the response screen uh, so we can see those as they come in. And so a reminder, oh great, so everyone's figuring out how to, to fill this out, that's great. So um, everyone on the agenda, I do see a question in the chat, which I'll, I'll remind everyone before we go, we are starting at the same time tomorrow with the same link. So I'll um, put that up once we've had a chance to look over some of these responses that are coming in. So. I mean, the first thing I read is everything on the agenda. So that's exciting to hear. Um, more about education and outreach, how to drive participation. I'm just kind of cherry picking and reading ones that are standing out. How to launch our Steven project, everything. Um, data collection and outreach, how to implement. So it sounds like, um, you know, there's certainly people that are curious, a lot of curiosity about um, the education side, the data side, a little bit of maintenance. I see a question here, um, or, excitement about influencing policy to reform how to use the data. And we'll certainly share some examples about that tomorrow. Okay, well, I will leave this up actually as we wrap up, you're welcome to log off when, when um, you're ready. But again, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we'll be joining again the same time tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern and using the same Zoom details. So I'll just go back to my slide for just one moment um, to show those details. And then I'll go back to this Mentimeter so we can see all the answers coming in. So again, thanks so much for coming again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time and the same link today. And um, all of those are in the Eventbrite uh, email. So you'll get another reminder uh, later tonight and again tomorrow morning. So I'll just go back. So thanks again, it was a pleasure having everyone and thank you again to our speakers. <laughs>